My name's Ro, and I'm a novelist. It's what I was put on this earth to do, but it hasn't been easy. I started writing almost accidentally, inspired to tell the story of a Greek myth which, like all Greek myths, existed in a vast collection of interconnected stories told by thousands of people over hundreds of years. What came down to us moderners from those original stories were fragmented pieces of fragmented stories, all jumbled into a mishmash of similar stories with gods and goddesses, heroes and monsters, and themes guiding people toward moral courage, the dangers of hubris, and a mortal's proper place before the gods. Modern storytellers and books tend to tell these stories in neat pieces for the sake of brevity and coherence. A modern telling might have the story of Daedalus and Icarus and the Wax Wings, or the story of Zeus and Europa. What a modern reader might not ever learn, though, is that these stories are closely connected, that Europa's son was the very king Daedalus and Icarus were fleeing on those Wax Wings, and also that a lot of interesting things happened in between, some of which you probably already know as other fragments of other Greek myths. I wanted to tell the whole story. Connecting all those fragments into something complete, something epic. So I started researching, putting pieces together like a great mythological puzzle without a picture on the box to guide me. Connecting similar fragments, grouping family histories, and drawing timelines. When it was finally completed, I had this magnificent story filled with gods, heroes, villains, magical circumstances, and fantastic creatures. But I didn't have a single word on paper. And in my ignorance, I thought, why not? Why not give it a go? Let's write the first chapter and see how it turns out. Probably like most novice writers, when I'd finished that first chapter, I was just naive enough to think that I'd written something good. So I kept writing. And here I am over 15 years later. Since then, I've completed seven novels and far more short stories and essays. I've earned master's degrees in fiction writing and narrative theory. I've built my own outlet as a self-published author and freelance editor. I've taught fiction writing and composition at the college level, worked on the staff of a literary magazine, and presented my theoretical scholarship at the International Society for the Study of Narrative. It's been quite the journey. My goal here is to share the most important parts of my journey with you, the knowledge and the lessons I've acquired during that long trek, and hopefully that'll save you a lot of trouble and time that, quite frankly, you don't need to waste. A huge portion of the process of becoming a good fiction writer is filled with trial and error, mistakes, mistakes, and more mistakes. And the hope is that somewhere along the way, you learn that you're making a mistake, and you learn how to fix that mistake, and you learn how to stop making that mistake again in the future. Most people who teach fiction writing think this is just the process because that's what they had to do after all. But I think that's simply not good enough. I've already fallen into most of the pits, and I've been observant enough to learn why. So why should you have to fall in a pit? I'm more than happy to clearly mark the big ones so you can avoid them. That's my goal when I'm teaching, to save you time and trouble and hopefully make the next generation of fiction writers better than the one that came before it. That'd be nice. So here goes. The following series of materials is a set of lessons I've collectively titled The Mechanics of Fiction Writing. It's a different approach to teaching fiction writing than anything else out there, and believe me, I've read hundreds of books on how to write fiction. From English professors, to magazine writers, to the top literary writers, to the top-selling authors in history, to publishers and editors, you name it, I've read it. And I'm not presenting this material to cut down anyone else's approach, because I've learned a ton from all of them. But most of them, at their very best, have some of the pieces you need. Fragments, you might say, much like the Greek mythology. What I've put together here in these lessons is the picture on the box, a system for understanding the big picture that will make every fiction writer better from a novice who's never taken a class to a successful published author. Fittingly, I'm going to begin with a story. Picture this. I just packed my entire life into a car, left behind all my family and friends, and moved all the way across the country to a place I knew nothing about, and all because I had the opportunity to spend the next three years of my life focusing on fiction writing. I'd been accepted to a prestigious MFA program, and I was going to get to study my craft with some of the great fiction writers in the country, full-time. Oh man, was I ecstatic. 
Thing was, I had no idea what to expect. No idea. I'd never taken a writing class in my life. I was as self-taught as they come, writing, 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 in my spare time between my various shift jobs. And when I wasn't actively working on a writing project, I was reading books on grammar and listening to lectures on syntax and sentence writing. I was so happy to be studying with the experts finally. I thought for sure they'd be able to help me fill in all the pieces my writing was missing. Here's what I expected when I walked into my first MFA fiction workshop. MFA equals Master of Fine Arts. I thought of art as a decent metaphor for what a fiction writing class should teach you. Take painting, for example. I don't know how to paint, so a good way to learn would be to sign up for a class, right? And on that first day of class, I'd expect a good painting instructor to offer a brief but fairly comprehensive introduction to the tools of the trade. Here is the canvas. There are many different surfaces painters commonly paint on, and here are the advantages and disadvantages of each. Here is your palette. You hold it like so, and you choose the colors for it as such so that you can mix the colors easily as needed. Here are your brushes. This one is good for this technique, which you would commonly use in a landscape. This one is better for fine detail work if you are painting portraits, etc. I was hoping for something like that in my MFA program, and boy was I greatly mistaken. That expectation could not have been any farther away from what workshops are actually like. Basically, a writing workshop involves a bunch of writers who are theoretically at about the same skill level, though almost never in reality. This group of writers reads your work and critiques it. Each writer in the group tries to offer useful feedback based on their individual reading of the story, filtered through their general understanding of how fiction writing works, and colored by their vague impression of what your writing might be trying to accomplish. At the head of a workshop is a more experienced writer, ideally a successful published author with accolades and the like. She or he does their very best to guide the discussion in a direction that they perceive to be fruitful, based on their general understanding of how fiction writing works, and their guess as to where you're trying to go with the piece you've presented to the group. Often it's a lot like ten blindfolded people throwing hundreds of darts at a moving dartboard for half an hour. There are bound to be a few darts sticking in the board at the end, and who knows, maybe one of those ten people hits the bullseye. But there's a hell of a mess of darts all over the floor and sticking in the walls, and maybe someone's even taken an eye out. And through all of this, if you're lucky, rarely, for brief periods of time, the experienced writer might talk about technique a little but usually in vague, metaphorical terms you need the priestess of the Delphic Oracle to help interpret. It's a lot of fun, though. Seriously, it is. But the thing is, workshop is far more like a tarot card reading than that first skills-based painting class I described. You take away the few pieces that you think might work, and you discard almost everything else. And through all of it, you probably feel just confused enough that you don't really know whether your writing is getting any better because you don't. And that's more or less how writing gets taught. That expert writer in the room, she got taught that way, and so did her teacher, and if he was lucky, he even had a teacher. So why isn't a writing class taught like a painting class? There are a few good reasons for it. The first isn't that difficult to imagine. The tools of painting are tangible. You can pick up a brush and ask, how does this one work, and what's it good for? and a teacher can demonstrate the way you should hold it in your hand, the movements you should make, and the way the bristles should curve against the canvas as you're working on a specific aspect of a painting. The tools of writing are abstract. You can't hold grammar and syntax in your hand, and you have to think to even realize how and when you're applying them, or even that you're applying them at all. That's a significant difference. You can work on improving these skills, but it isn't self-evident that they're markedly improving unless you start from a place where they're really bad to begin with. And don't worry, this isn't going to turn into a grammar lesson. I'm just using it as an illustration. The second reason is that writing fiction is a more complex business than painting. I don't mean to belittle painting in any way. It's an incredible skill, and Lord knows I can't do it, but it just is. Writing is one of the most cognitively complex artistic endeavors a human being can attempt. I'll show you why. Take the following sentence. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely, having little or no money in my purse, and nothing particular to interest me on shore, 
I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. That's the second sentence in Herman Melville's masterpiece, Moby Dick. Now check out this sentence. Having little or no money in my purse some years ago, never mind how long precisely, and nothing particular to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. Now this one. Never mind how long precisely, some years ago, I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world, having little or no money in my purse and nothing particular to interest me on shore. I've changed zero of the 40 words in that sentence, and for brevity's sake, I've only included two of the myriad ways I could have rewritten that sentence using the exact same words. It changes the sentence. It still contains the same basic propositions, and largely the meaning remains the same. But there's a reason Melville wrote that sentence the way he did, and not the two ways I rewrote it. I've only changed this one sentence in Moby Dick along one dimension, syntax, the order the words and phrases appear in the sentence. Now, imagine how many ways I could change that sentence if I started to change the same sentence by using different words. Linguists would call this dimension paradigmatic, in case you were interested. A ways back, don't sweat the details, out of dough and bored to death with the neighborhood, I figured I'd hop aboard a ship and check out the ocean for a change. Or, if I changed paradigm and syntax. I went whaling once, amigo, no need to worry about the details, but it was a while ago when I was out of scratch and dead tired with the solid earth. Now, all I've done is change this one sentence in a novel with thousands upon thousands of sentences, and I've only messed with this sentence on two dimensions, word choice, and word order. To the extent that I could, I didn't even attempt to change the meaning. I have, though, haven't I? Even if it's just a little. And all of the changes that I made are products of cognitive choices that happened when I decided to put down one word instead of another, just the same as Melville did over 150 years ago. He had an infinite number of ways he could have crafted Moby Dick that weren't an eternal literary masterpiece but he ended up choosing the right one. How did he do that? Well, there's not a single easy answer for that, unfortunately, but I can give you a vague picture based on the example above, and this gets to the heart of why teaching and learning fiction writing are both necessarily vague arts. Here's another sentence from Moby Dick, arguably the most famous one, and not even the shortest if you can believe it. Call me Ishmael. Now, we already know there's an infinite number of ways we could change the words and meaning in that sentence if we decide to change syntax, paradigm, and the number of words we decide to use. I'm Ishmael, friends. My name's Ishmael, but you can call me Izzy if you like, given that I prefer nicknames and tend to give everyone else I know a nickname the second I meet them. Ishmael's the name, Whalen's the game. Okay, been there, done that. Fair enough. Now, watch this. There once was a man from Nantucket, whose name was Ishmael Puckett. Game changer. Did you catch that? Suddenly, Ishmael's not the only one here. The words are coming from someplace else. But where? We've just irrevocably altered Moby Dick across a whole other dimension by changing the narrator. Ishmael is no longer the speaker. In these lessons, I'm going to outline the six major dimensions a writer needs to understand. And don't worry, I'm going to keep it simple. Of these six dimensions, there is only one you can make a case for having a finite number of choices. I only mention the complexity to explain why the teaching of fiction writing has always been almost strictly trial and error. Basically, you're dealing with six dimensions of infinity, and all of them deal with abstract concepts like word choice, word order, the narrator's orientation to the story, And we haven't even begun to talk about the most complex dimension of all, the events that actually happen in the story. Head spinning? Don't worry, there's a lot to learn. But if we take each thing one step at a time and talk in simple terms, you'll have a better understanding of how fiction works than you could hope to get from the finest MFA programs. Because I'm going to approach this in the way that no one else does. I'm going to articulate each of the components of fiction just like the painting instructor in that first class. Here are your tools, here's how they function, here's how great writers have used these tools successfully in a story before, here's how you can poach those moves, here's how to know when to use which tool. That's what these lessons are about. We're going to get there, 
Just bear with me a little bit longer on the groundwork, and we'll be on to the good stuff. Promise. So I had this professor in my MFA program. Call her Kim. Her name actually is Kim. Amazing writer. Consistently one of the greatest, according to a little organization that gives prizes, by the name of Pulitzer, if we're being specific. And when Kim sits down to write a book, she has the same blank screen as we all do. It's the same as the blank piece of paper Melville and countless others had before word processors. Kim has the same six dimensions of infinity from which to choose, and by her account, she just starts with a single idea and a keyboard, and she writes. And she keeps writing. And wherever the story takes her, that's where she lets it go. Doesn't outline, doesn't plan in advance, doesn't direct the action in any conscious way. She just lets the story do the talking, so to speak. And she waits to find out what happens in the end, same as her reader. This, I would say, is how most literary fiction writers work. It's a very common process. It involves a lot of spontaneity and intuition on the front end, and it involves a deep commitment to revision and rewriting on the back end, because no one just sits down and writes a masterpiece, or even an excellent draft on the first pass. Now take David. He's a pretty good writer, too. He wrote a big old masterpiece of his own titled Infinite Jest. Lots of the very best literary writers and critics think David's one of the best writers of the last hundred years, and they're probably not wrong in thinking people will still be reading his work for a long time to come. Check out this passage from a story in Esquire that he wrote some years back. 2a. Meanwhile, F.L. is answering J.'s orage question in vehement neg, tears appearing in I. Holy shit, no. God, no, no, never. Had loved her always. Was never as fully there as when he and J. were making love if in J's POV, insert together after love. 2A, 1. At emotional height of dialogue, tears streaming down half-face, FL confesses, declares that he still loves J, has all this time, five years in fact, sometimes still thinks of J while making love to his current fiancé, which causes him to feel guilty. That's a snippet from a story titled Adult World 2, and as you can probably tell, this story is written as if it were a set of notes that an author would scribble while planning to write a story. The irony David intended to convey with this story is that the set of details is so precise you don't really need to write the story. You might interpret it as either a cynical slap at how mechanical contemporary fiction might be, or perhaps it was a straight critique of the method of such writers who do plan so methodically. Or perhaps he was too depressed, as he so tragically was, to be bothered to write the story for real. Only David knew. For our purposes, though, this passage illustrates a contrast, the yang to Kim's yin. These two approaches represent the extremes of how different writers approach fiction writing. The freewheeling, intuitive, let-the-story-come-as-it-may-Kims of the writing world, and the hyper-prepared, over-outlined, plan-every-last-detail David's. The reason I've drawn this contrast is to illustrate the third reason why there isn't already a series of lessons like this out there. Most writers are Kims. There's a good reason for this. Think of the stereotype of a poet. Does she have a clean car? Iron wrinkles out of her jeans? No, nah, thought not. It's far more likely she's running around trying to remember where she left the keys to said messy car. Hint to the poet, they're in the pocket of your wrinkled jeans hunched up in a ball beside the laundry basket. Dirty clothes go in the basket, by the way. In personality psychology, the dimension of openness is tightly tied to creativity. Artists and other creative people don't tend to systematize things. It's why that poet can't be bothered to put her dirty jeans in the laundry basket. Close is close enough. And it's also why someone else hasn't come along to write a series on the mechanics of fiction writing yet. It would take someone who would look at a problem with infinite complexity and think, how can I develop a system to account for an infinite possibility of choices across six different dimensions and develop it into a guide for practical application? That's just not how Kim's work. Most Davids, on the other hand, thankfully, care far more about engineering bridges that don't collapse in a hurricane and building voice recognition software that can hear the difference between Wilgo and Dildo even when the speaker has a Spanish accent. And do we ever need both Kims and Davids in this world? Personality-wise, I tend more toward being a Kim than a David. 
but I was trained to systematize by a former NASA engineer when I was working in another field. For a writer, though, when I approach one of my own projects, I'm likely closer to the David end of the spectrum than the average writer, but I've never written anything close to the excerpt from David's story that I shared above. So what's this all about, the planning versus intuition discussion? I'm mentioning all of this because if you're like most writers, it's hard for you to be bothered to listen to a series of lectures about writing. You'd much rather spend your precious time writing. And I get that fact. In fact, I used to say something like that all the time. If I've got a choice between reading and writing, I'm going to write nine times out of ten and ten times on Sunday. It's a very Kim thing to say. I'll just keep writing and revising until I know the book is finished. And I'll know when I know. Fair enough. I know I don't need to convince the Davids here of this approach's value. I had them at the mechanics of fiction writing. But I'm going to make a serious case to the Kims still hanging in there. Moby Dick has almost a quarter million words in it. Multiply that by the number of choices in syntax and paradigm. Then multiply that by the number of possibilities for the events in each chapter. The setting for each scene. The thematic conceits and the subtext. Melville had to have made at least a hundred million narrative decisions during the year he was writing Moby Dick, and what that means is that most of those decisions were not conscious choices. One simply cannot make that many conscious decisions in a year. Most of what writers do when they write, they don't know about. Even the most meticulous planner still will only ever touch a fraction of the choices they make on a conscious level. I'm not advocating for anyone to be less intuitive. It all still has to come from that same mysterious place that gave us Bach, Da Vinci, and Emily Dickinson. What learning the mechanics of fiction can do is offer you an understanding of the big decisions, because if you're going to make a hundred million decisions, some of them are going to be bad ones, and if you make the wrong decision on any of the big decisions, you're going to be revising your novel for the next five years without a real clue if you're going in the right direction. These lessons will help you to tell the good decisions from the bad decisions for your work. It will clearly outline the tools you need to understand how to use and how to apply each for the desired effect you're looking to create in your fiction. And if you're a beginner and don't know yet, it's going to help you to learn how to start making those choices, but more importantly why one choice is right for one story when a very different choice would be right for another. Additionally, these lessons will give you a much sharper vocabulary for discussing both your work and the fiction of other writers. This is something that the trial and error approach is seriously lacking. Anyone who has ever been in a workshop can attest that most of the conversations in them go something like, random dude in workshop. You know, I don't really know if I'm on board with the whole tone of the narration. I mean, I like the overall style, but it's just, you know... Something about the narration rubbed me the wrong way. Me to myself. I wonder what the hell this guy thinks he means when he uses the words tone and style. What on earth does he even think he's trying to say? The truth? He probably doesn't know. As demonstrated above, this stuff is incredibly complex. Articulating it properly is even harder. Having a useful name for all the tools you'll need in your writer's toolbox will help you not only to understand your work, but that of your fellow writers. And it will help you learn the moves of your favorite writers. Figure out exactly what they're doing and make those moves yourself. I'm going to try and avoid being so broadly metaphorical as to be cryptic. Remember the painting class. Here are your tools. Here's how you use them. So where am I getting all this useful information, you might be inclined to ask. I am a compiler. Most of these lessons are adapted from lessons I've learned and not created. I've turned over every stone I can think to lift in order to understand how fiction works. That's a lot of stones, and there are fragments of useful information under many of them. Primarily, I'm drawing from four areas of study. Narrative craft, narrative theory, cognitive and evolutionary psychology, and linguistics and semiotics. If you don't know what all those fields are in any real sense, that's fine. I'll give a brief overview. Craft Guides You've probably seen a book like this if you've taken a fiction writing class or looked for a how-to guide for writing fiction at the bookstore. They range from pretty good to god-awful. There's a fair amount of useful information in a good one, but it's usually jumbled a bit. They often speak in broad metaphorical terms that will please Kim's and drive David's crazy. 
and sometimes they get major pieces wrong. They derive much of their authority from quoting great writers on their writing process, or on their musings about certain aspects of the craft. This can be both good and bad. Given that most of the decisions writers make are necessarily subconscious, most writers only think they know what they're doing. Often, they'll lead you in the right direction, but just as often, they'll only speak in vague metaphorical terms or give advice that's great in some circumstances and flat-out wrong in others. Just because someone has intuitively learned to do something at a high level doesn't mean they can teach you to do it. Go take a ski lesson and you'll find that out real fast. Narrative Theory This is an academic field of study that uses an empirical approach to explore stories and their component elements. Narrative theorists study texts in great detail in order to understand the different aspects of narrative. A good example of this is the distinction between a character narrator in the story like Ishmael and a disembodied narrator outside the story, the sort of godlike voice that many novels use. Narrative theorists make these and hundreds of other useful distinctions when studying stories. The problem with them is that they're a bunch of geeks who like to make up words like focalization, metadiegetic, and paralipsis. They also tend to be terrible writers who are overly in love with their own words and intellect. So it's not always fun wading through thousands of pages of their scholarship to pull out the little nuggets of useful information that can help make you a better writer. Fortunately, somebody's already done that for you. Roe takes facetious bow. Cognitive and Evolutionary Psychology I'm not the only narrative theorist to make the connection between the cognitive process of storytelling and the necessity to understand the human brain. In fact, there's a whole subfield that really wonky professor types call cognitive narratology. These are people trying to decode the links between storytelling and cognition. They include linguists, psychologists, neurologists, narratologists, and a whole bunch of other scholars and researchers with fancy titles. The bottom line is that a story happens in the brain, and knowing how that happens will make you a much more powerful writer. And you don't even need to take a course in neuroanatomy. I've already done that for you, and I'm happy to translate. Roe takes slightly less facetious bow. Linguistics and semiotics. These fields study how language functions to symbolically represent real-world objects and ideas, as well as how those linguistic representations vary from language to language. We probably won't get too deep into the weeds here, but it's useful to consider that as a writer, words are your ultimate tools, the specific delivery mode for your ideas. You could consider words a lot like the way a doctor considers the cells composing a patient's body. They're the base particles that give rise to a functioning story. The lessons here are more about the big picture than the small. But it bears mentioning that a considerable amount of thought about the smallest units went into bringing you a clearer view of the big picture. And speaking of the big picture, congratulations, we're almost there. We are about to begin to explore the six major compartments in the writer's toolbox, your abstract brushes, if you will. They're probably going to sound familiar. They are the plot, the narrator, the characters, the story world, the text, and the subtext. These are the six dimensions of fiction we'll cover in detail. By the end of these lessons, you'll know them inside and out, and have a thorough understanding of how each one shapes a story. Each of these dimensions, as we've already discovered, is incredibly complex. We'll cover how you can use each aspect of these dimensions to tell the precise story you want to tell in the most effective way possible. You'll learn which tools work best for which types of stories and why. And we'll try to do it without getting away from the purpose of this whole exercise, how you can write a better story. On this front, I would be remiss if I failed to mention the following about your tools. All of the dimensions of written fiction are critical. You may hear some very smart writers say things like, literary fiction is all about characters. And there is some truth to that statement. But it's more useful to consider each of these six categories in the same way a doctor would think about the systems of the body. A doctor who has a patient with a bad cardiovascular system is rightly worried for that patient. Never mind that the nervous system and the musculature are pristine. The fate of a story conceived with only character is as dead as the brain without a heartbeat. You'll find many such stories taking their final breaths in the slush piles of literary magazines.
soon to be sent to the literary world's mortuary with the word rejected stamped on the toe tag. These six dimensions function together in a living work of fiction. They are interdependent and all must be attended to. But before we do that, there's one final pressing piece of business before we start to talk about plot. So you think you want to write fiction? Great. Go for it. No, seriously, I mean it. Go do it. That's usually how a fiction writer starts. They decide they want to write fiction and they start writing. That's how I did it, and probably you too. Stories are deep in the human psyche, and when I say deep, I mean deeper than any of us know. I suspect they go far deeper than many research psychologists even presume, even plausibly preceding language as we know it, if you can wrap your head around that. So it's a pretty natural thing for you to want to generate fictional stories. People have been doing it universally across all cultures for tens of thousands of years, probably for as long as people have been people. But you don't want to just tell stories. You want to tell good stories. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Good on you, as the Aussies would say. Odds are pretty good that you already have some idea of what a story is, and I'll go so far as to say you probably have a decent, if somewhat vague, idea of what a good story is, too. I took a class one time with a highly regarded fiction writer. Let's call him Lucas. This was a week-long evening seminar while I was in graduate school. And the thing about graduate school is that it's very similar to holding down two full-time jobs at the same time, between taking classes, teaching classes, and doing the planning and reading for said classes, an 80-hour week is very common. Now, imagine a crowd of about 15 experienced adult fiction writers, overly caffeinated, on an average of four hours sleep, walking into Lucas's seminar at the end of a long day and watching him begin by asking the question, what is a story? Seriously, he asked that question to a room full of exhausted fiction writers as his opener, and he asked it in a way that suggested he didn't know the answer as a philosophical musing, and nobody said a word. We all just listened to Lucas contemplate how stories were these mysterious things that were so important in our lives, that shaped how we learned and grew and formed our understanding of the culture we operated in, and entertained us, etc., etc. And then he started talking about myths, and whoa, what is a myth? And what is the difference between a story and a myth? How do we even begin to... If you made it through my introduction to these lessons, you're probably well aware that while poor Lucas was reflecting on these things, seemingly unproductively, old Roe was sitting there, absolutely bored to a state of catatonia. Picture a teenage boy in an accounting class with his neck tilted all the way back, staring straight at the ceiling. That's about what I was feeling inside, because if I didn't already have the answers to these seemingly ponderous questions Lucas was looking to blow our minds with, which I did. I also had a smartphone in my pocket, offering instantaneous access to the entire body of human knowledge. These aren't deep questions for serious people anymore. People have been studying this stuff for hundreds of years and have left their knowledge behind for us to use. If you find yourself in a class where a professor like Lucas is hoping to expand your mind by trying to impress you with the difficulty of defining the topic, they either didn't have time to think of a better lesson plan, or they're woefully underqualified to be teaching that class. I liked Lucas a lot. He was a really sweet guy, with the right idea and the wrong lesson plan. Here's where Lucas was right. If you're trying to do anything in life, you stand a much better chance of doing that thing if you know exactly what you're trying to do. But remember, most writers are intuitive, and a lot of them only sort of know what they're trying to do probably a lot like you at the start of these lessons. Today we're going to define a story, and like all definitions, as we'll soon see, defining a story isn't easy. I'll show you why. But our purpose in defining a story is twofold. The first is to develop a useful tool for your arsenal, an exact idea of what it is you're trying to accomplish when you set your fingers on your keyboard 
you might do well to think of fiction writing as a game you're trying to learn, a very hard one. It might be as difficult as that blindfolded darts game with the moving dartboard I described in the introduction. But by the end of this lesson, you will know what game you're playing, that you're trying to stick your dart into that moving board, blindfolded as you are. At least you'll have the objective. The second reason is that if you ever have a teacher like Lucas, you can pull out your phone and go, here, right here. This is what a story is to fiction writers. It says it right here. It's necessarily not a perfect definition, but it's good enough. Let's move on, please. And to that end, I'll start with an online dictionary definition. Story. Noun. An account of imaginary or real people and events told for entertainment. That's probably about what you were thinking, right? It's not that hard, Ro. What are you getting at? Give Lucas his due here and think about what that definition tells us and what we're trying to do. Create good stories. See if you can pick at the seams of this definition. I'm sure you can. Where is it weak? You might begin by asking something like, well, what exactly constitutes an event? A poetry reading? Sure. Grass growing? Maybe. And what constitutes entertainment exactly? That'd be different things for different people, surely. Or the big question for our purposes, does this help us figure out what we need to do when we're staring at a blank screen? Marginally at best, I'd say. It doesn't do a great job of telling us what we should be aiming at. Here's why. This may seem like a total tangent, by the way, but we're going to keep running into the same problem over and over again. Suppose I gave you four words that could be grouped into a category, for example, the category domicile. Let's use the words house, mansion, shack, and castle. Now, you probably have a fairly good idea of the difference between a mansion and a shack, right? Sure, but let's say I brought you to a street in a very wealthy neighborhood and asked you to tell me which of the dwellings on this street were houses and which ones were mansions. It might not be so simple. And it would get an awful lot harder if I asked you to develop a precise set of parameters that clearly outlined at which point a shack became a house, a house became a mansion, and a mansion became a castle. Borders, as David Foster Wallace noted, are porous. Thus, if one is so inclined to be annoyingly pedantic, one can pick away at every border. It's not profound. Now, the problem gets doubly sticky once you realize that words are categories. We could play the same game we played with domicile with a verb like run. It's why there are synonyms like trot, gallop, sprint, haul ass, bound, etc. Or a noun like seat. Well, a chair is a seat, so is a staircase, or a stump, and a big enough rock, etc. The problem here is that words are categories, and categories are fuzzy things. They're so fuzzy, in fact, that cognitive psychologists have three different working explanations for how we categorize things. We fit like with like, all the buildings we think look like houses. We use exemplars, the house that looks most like a house. And we form theories, the attributes we think qualify something to be a house. We don't need to go too deep here. We just need to know that when we're trying to define a story, we're trying to draw borders using all three of those cognitive techniques at once by 1. Collating a long list of stories we know to be stories, 2. Considering which stories seem most story-like, and 3. Considering what attributes make a story a story. It's a difficult, fuzzy, moving target. So Lucas wasn't exactly wrong after all. It's why he was seemingly so perplexed by a question he should have had technical mastery over. So what do we do? First, let's reconsider the Oxford Dictionary definition of the category story. Who is that definition written for exactly? Who goes to the dictionary to look up a word? Someone who presumably doesn't know what the word means, right? That's the type of tool a dictionary is. So people drawing boundaries for the Oxford Dictionary have to consider their audience. It's not novelists. Presumably they know what a story is, right? Right, Lucas? One would hope. What we need is a better frame. We need to draw our boundaries for the category story with our goal in mind. We are writers who want to write a good story. What is the target we're aiming at, using all the best available knowledge, drawn from a diversity of relevant sources, 
compiled together into a set of attributes that will allow me to understand what I'm doing when I'm sitting at my keyboard pecking away. And here it is. Written Fiction That Works is an interest-grabbing set of language-based instructions arranged in an order that cues the reader to simulate an approximate cognitive model of a specific modal universe that changes in such a way across the course of the simulation that it entertains, instructs, or explores the nature of the human condition. Whoa, 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 Ro, what the hell was that? I thought you said this stuff was going to be easy. What are you doing? Yes, I did. I'm sorry. I did. And it is going to be easy. But if you'll also recall, I also said that I was going to give you the exact definition of a story. And I also said that writing fiction might be the most cognitively complex activity a human can undertake. And fear not. I also said that what we're looking to accomplish in this lesson is to develop a useful tool to help us understand what a story is and how to write one. That definition above is what fiction is. That's my technical definition of what a written story is, and I've thought a lot about it. I couldn't subtract a single word from it if we're talking technically about what a story is. But for our purposes, we're going to shrink that Frankenstein's monster of a definition down to a manageable size that makes for a useful tool. Here's the shortened definition we're going to use, and I think you'll agree it's a more practical tool for our purposes. Good fiction is an interesting cognitive simulation of a dynamic story world that entertains, instructs, or explores the nature of the human condition. Ah, much better, right? That's more like it. It's shorter, punchy, and more to the point, or our point at least, which is to develop a target to aim at as fiction writers. And this seems like a much easier target to hit. This is a game we can play. Okay, so let's pick at the seams of this one a little and see what we come up with. If we read that definition closely, there are four main propositions embedded in it. They are 1. Good fiction is interesting. 2. It is a cognitive simulation. 3. Of a dynamic story world. 4. That entertains, instructs, or explores the nature of the human condition. Let's take a look at each of those elements in its own right. The first proposition is that good fiction is interesting. Now, based on our earlier discussion of the porousness of borders and picking at the seams of definitions, your spidey senses are surely tingling. What does good mean, Ro? What the hell does interesting mean? That could mean anything. Yes, indeed, well played. That's the byproduct of the shrunken head version of the Frankenstein monster definition I gave above. You need to know only this. By good, I mean functioning, working, the reader is reading, and that the story you've written is hitting the marks of the three subsequent categories. It must be generating a cognitive simulation. It must be moving in time and space, and it must be entertaining and or edifying. By interesting, I simply mean it catches and holds interest. And we'll get into what catches everyone's interest when we talk about plot, specifically suspense. But if a book catches no interest, it is not a book, it is a doorstop, nothing more. Pull back for a minute here, friendo. Stop nipping at the threads for the time being and go with it. Good fiction is interesting, right? Good. The second proposition is that a story is a cognitive simulation. Well, hello there. Who's this? It's the best-selling horror writer in the history of Earth, here to enlighten us on point two? Welcome, Stephen. Thanks for stopping by. That's so very nice of you to join us. Telepathy, you say? Telepathy, of course. My name is Stephen King. I'm writing the first draft of this part at my desk on a snowy morning in December of 1997. So, let's assume that you're in your favorite receiving place just as I am in the place where I do my best transmitting. We'll have to perform our mentalist routine not just over distance, but over time as well. Yet that presents no real problem. If we can still read Dickens, Shakespeare, and Herodotus, I think we can manage the gap between 1997 and the present. And here we go. Actual telepathy in action. Look. Here's a table covered with a red cloth. On it is a cage the size of a small fish aquarium. In it is a rabbit with a pink nose and pink rimmed eyes. In its front paws is a carrot stub upon which it is contentedly munching. On its back, clearly marked in blue ink, is the numeral 8. Do we see the same thing? 
We'd have to get together and compare notes to make absolutely sure, but I think we do. There will be necessary variations, of course. Some receivers will see a tablecloth which is turkey red. Some will see one that's scarlet, while others may see still other shades. We're having a meeting of the minds. I sent you a table with a red cloth on it, a cage, a rabbit, and the number eight in blue ink. You got them all, especially that blue eight. We've engaged in an act of telepathy. We sure have, Stephen. That was very cool. Thanks for that. Has anyone ever told you you're pretty good at telepathy before? It's probably not a mistake that you're one of the world's all-time best-selling authors. It may just have something to do with the fact that you know exactly what you're aiming at. And now the rest of us do, too. Stephen wasn't kidding about writing being telepathic. He's dead serious, and he's not wrong. But don't just take his word for it, or mine for that matter. You can ask Eleanor McGuire. Who's she, and why would anyone ask her, you may ask? Good question. Eleanor McGuire is a world-renowned neurologist and medical researcher who studies an area of the hippocampus that governs the brain's ability to map space and form mental imagery. And given the little exercise that Stephen was so kind as to take us through, you might be guessing that it's pretty important and has something to do with your brain processing fiction. And you'd be right, it has everything to do with processing fictional narratives. In fact, Eleanor's patients who had severe enough damage to that area of the hippocampus reported that subsequent to their injuries, they were no longer able to read novels. They could understand the words on the page and process a sentence's meaning in a literal sense, but her patients had lost the ability to simulate the sequence of events portrayed in the story. As a result, the novels became meaningless. Her patients said they really missed reading stories, too. A terrible loss. Eleanor's research is evidence that novels must be cognitively simulated for them to be understood. Don't ever make the mistake of forgetting that a cognitive simulation in our reader's brain is the target we're aiming at as fiction writers. Just like the cognitive simulation Stephen so skillfully generated in our brains, that's what we're aiming at, or at least in part. We can't forget about the third proposition. Stephen's simulation was missing something. It's not really a story, is it? It's just a rabbit sitting in a cage. Remember the third proposition. The cognitive simulation is of a dynamic story world. In order for a story to be a story, something has to happen, right? That requires two things. Some form of movement and a space for that movement to take place in. Dynamic simply means that something is moving. Actions are happening. If no actions are happening, no matter how beautiful and interesting the language, it's still not really a story. Hello, poetry. We'll get into this in greater detail in the next lesson, but for now, it's sufficient to think dynamic equals movement and a story must move. And a story world? You may not have seen that word very often, but it means exactly what it seems like it means. It's the fictional universe where the story takes place. That galaxy far, far away, that's the Star Wars story world. Ahab's whaling ship and the world around it, the Moby Dick story world. You get the idea. Good thing, too. We're going to use that word a lot. So, to the final proposition, that entertains, instructs, or explores the nature of the human condition. This gets to the purpose of fiction. Why we read. And if we're seam-pulling, this part of the target is admittedly a little more abstract. You might have seen it written somewhere before that a story's purpose is to entertain and instruct. It's far too old a proposition for it to be my idea. It goes all the way back to the earliest writing we have about writing, from a tunic-wearing dude you might have heard of by the name Aristotle. Aristotle came from a culture where stories were not just very important, but incredibly refined for their time. The plays Aristotle attended and wrote about were a product of hundreds of years of dramatic competitions at religious festivals, and those competitions drove developments in storytelling techniques, innovations in presentation and acting, theater technology and casting, and a host of other meaningful concepts that advanced the process of storytelling in Western culture. We could take entertain and instruct at face value and probably call those a decent rough estimate of why people consume fiction. And they probably fit well enough with the good in our first proposition. Remember, we're trying to develop a useful tool now, not tear fruitlessly at the seams. One place where we could go deep down a rabbit hole is with the word instruct. I'm sure more than a handful of PhD dissertations on the ways fiction can be instructive have been written. 
Hell, you could write one for an English degree and turn around and write another in psychology and still another in philosophy. And I've probably gone on far too long already to try your patience with too much more on this front. But my interpretation of what Aristotle and the ancient storytellers understood about fiction being instructive is that it should be edifying. If it entertains, that's awesome and good enough to be good for the purposes of hitting our target. The way I interpret instruct here is that some good stories offer us something beyond a few laughs and a short break from our real-world troubles. They offer us something deep and human. One might even say they explore the nature of the human condition. If you're looking for instruction on how to get ahead, find true love, or find the job of your dreams, that's over in the self-help section beside the books on religion and DIY carpentry. You don't want to take life advice from a writer anyway. Look up any writer in the biography section between history and tragic comedy. There's probably a liquor store in between. And here I'm tempted to stop, because the more I try to draw boundaries and elucidate precisely what I mean, the more things seem to get fuzzy and slip away like an Escher print, infinitely winding its way around a staircase. Remember the porousness of borders, and that words are necessarily categories, and precise definitions are tough. Let's call it good enough for our purposes here. That's what our brain does anyway. Here is your target. Fire away. Good fiction is an interesting cognitive simulation of a dynamic story world that entertains, instructs, or explores the nature of the human condition. That's one useful tool for your toolbox, a fuzzy idea of what the hell we're doing. And if your brain hasn't totally turned to mush yet, I'm going to include my best attempt at a brief explanation of the Frankenstein monster story definition for anyone still interested. Let's take a look at it piece by piece. Here's that definition again. Written fiction that works is an interest-grabbing set of language-based directions arranged in an order that cues the reader to simulate an approximate cognitive model of a specific modal universe that changes in such a way across the course of the simulation that it entertains, instructs, or explores the nature of the human condition. I hope that makes quite a bit more sense after the rest of the lesson, but there are still a few things worth being specific about here. Written fiction that works. By works, I mean functions in the ways we talked about in this lesson. It grabs the reader's interest, simulates a cognitive model of a story world that moves and entertains, instructs, etc. Interest grabbing will be covered more when we talk about literary suspense. For now, just know that some events grab a reader's interest, like a fire in an apartment building or an earthquake, and some don't, like a bake sale or an afternoon pulling weeds in the community garden. I'll teach you a surefire way to tell the difference shortly. Remember, if it doesn't grab interest, the book becomes a doorstop, and that's not working in the way we care about. Language-based equals written system of language, from Chinese characters to Arabic, hell, who knows, maybe even hieroglyphics. It's important to remember that writers are in the business of symbolic signals. Directions arranged in an order that cues the reader. This gets to the writer's art arranging the words to direct the cognitive model in one way instead of another. Your words are your primary tools because they are the specific cues your reader receives. Remember that blue eight on the rabbit? You wouldn't have the image in your head if Stephen hadn't presented the precise cues on its back, clearly marked, in blue ink, is the numeral eight. One of the reasons Stephen's such a successful writer is the order in which he arranged these cues. We'll get into this more when we talk about story world building, but for now, you might think about why Stephen chose to cue you to think about the rabbit's back before the numeral 8, to simulate an approximate cognitive model of a specific modal universe. This gets to the whole telepathy thing again. The words acting as cues are the stimuli for a reader's mental model of the story world. By modal, I mean hypothetical or imagined. It's a term borrowed from linguistics that forms the subjunctive in languages that have a subjunctive mood for describing hypothetical actions, events, thoughts, etc. In English, we use words like should or might to indicate thoughts or actions that haven't actually occurred, at least yet. As in, Ro should move on now, or I might stop listening. The approximate cognitive model was demonstrated quite nicely by Stephen in the way he talked about the difference in the shades of red in the tablecloth beneath the rabbit's cage. A writer can never be anything more than somewhat precise with respect to the cognitive model her reader will generate. Telepathy is necessarily a cooperative act. 
The writer provides the cue, red cloth, and the reader provides their cognitive interpretation of what their brain thinks a red cloth looks like. And as a bonus for sticking around, you'll get this little nugget early. There's a word for this in cognitive psychology called schema. You could think of schema as your brain's warehouse of representations of generic objects in the world. The picture of a train you see in your mind's eye when you read the word train, for example. And your schematic train is going to be slightly different from everyone else's schematic train based on your unique experience of learning what a train is. That changes in such a way across the course of the simulation that it entertains, instructs, or explores the nature of the human condition. And here you can probably guess that by changes across the course of the simulation, we're talking about movement in the story world. Things are dynamic, and dynamic in a way that's either interesting, meaningful, or both. There. That wasn't so bad, was it? And now we've got a pretty good idea of exactly what we need to do. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but we sure stand a hell of a better chance of getting it right now that we know what we're trying to do here. So, with all that settled, in the words of that infamous psychopathic clown, And here we go. Mercifully, I'm not going to try and define plot for you. It's far too nebulous a category. If you thought my story definition was tedious, well that would only be a warm-up act to any attempt at defining what plot is. Remember the vague notion you started the last lesson with about defining a story? That'll do for plot right now, because this word is a garbage heap of various challenges a writer faces when thinking about how to tell their story. The word plot is a category that contains all of the following. 1. The way a writer manages time. 2. How long a writer chooses to dwell on each story element. 3. How much action and how much description there is in the story. 4. The sequence the actions of the story unfold in. Oh, and 5. There's that little matter of the actual stuff happening in the story. Remember those six dimensions of infinity I was talking about in the introduction? Hint. This is dimension one, infinity and beyond. All the aspects that fit into the very broad category plot are important. We're going to talk about them all. But one thing we are not going to do is to make any attempt to define plot, because really, we're talking about at least five distinctly different aspects of written narratives, and probably more. One thing we can do, though, is to make use of our story definition to guide us toward what a writer is trying to accomplish with plot. Here. Our target words from the story definition are dynamic and interesting. A good writer needs to make the story world move, and he needs to do so in a way that grabs the reader's attention. This is fundamentally what plot is all about. With that said, let's get your story moving. I have a feeling you might be wondering, how do we get our fiction moving, Ro? Well, that's great, because that's exactly what I'm going to show you now. We're going to start with the type of game you might see on Sesame Street or in a kindergarten class. You can handle that. Spot the difference between these two groups of sentences. Jenny poured the kibble into the bowl and set the dish on the floor for chance. Maximilian took off his cap. Kylie bonked her head on the doorframe. Ouch. Okay, that was group one. Now let's take a look at group two. The moose is on the loose. In April, violets covered the field from the tree line all the way down to the brook. Denny felt terrible about the way he'd spoken to Clara. Now's the part where you take a few seconds to figure out if you can spot the difference before Roe tells you. <laughs> 
Now's the part where Roe tells you. If you had grammar lessons in school, you might have been taught the difference between an action verb and a linking verb. And they might even have taught you that an action verb conveys action, go figure, and that a linking verb conveys a feeling or a state of being, like feeling bad or being on the loose. What they probably didn't mention about the important distinction between action verbs and linking verbs is that one of these categories of verbs makes fiction go. Do you know which one? I'll bet you do. That's right, they're your friends, the action verbs. Now you might think I'm being patronizing or taking you too deep into the weeds. Pedantic narrative geek that I am, and Roe is nothing if not that. But this is a very important distinction to know as a writer, and here's why. Let's take a closer look at that very first sentence again. Jenny poured the kibble into the bowl and set the dish on the floor for chance. There are two distinct actions going on here, but there's something else critical about this to notice as well. Movement has happened. The kibble from the implied container into the bowl, then also the bowl moving from an implied height down to the floor. In order for your brain to process these actions, it has to generate a temporal sequence in your mental simulation. Time has moved forward from one moment when the kibble was in the bag to another moment when the previously empty bowl now has food in it. And that full bowl, which was on the counter at the beginning of the sentence, is now on the floor. Time has moved forward. Action verbs are the figurative play button for your cognitive simulation. Want to hit play in your story? Add some action verbs. This is how we get a story moving, and we must have movement in a story world to have a story at all. What about that other kind of verb, those pesky linking verbs? What are they good for, Ro? All I want is action. Well, slow down there for a minute, soldier. Linking verbs are useful too. Consider this sentence. In April, violets covered the field from the tree line all the way down to the brook. What a pretty image. Boy, that's a world I wouldn't mind spending a minute observing and dwelling in for a while. Remember that just as a story needs the passage of time for it to be a story, it also needs a space for the story to unfold in. Linking verbs are great to describe both the space and the story world and the characters' states of being or motivations, as in the last sentence from that group. Denny felt terrible about the way he'd spoken to Clara. Here, the reader is presented with information about how Denny feels, his state of being. And there's no specific temporal sequence here the way there would be if the sentence read, Denny told Clara she was an imbecile. Instead, the reader just knows Denny was experiencing a bad feeling about the way he'd spoken to Clara, and he should, that meanie. And the state of being exists over an unspecified and unmoving period of time. Here, the cognitive simulation isn't progressing, it's standing still. Linking verbs are a writer's pause button. In contrast to a page of writing with a lot of action verbs, and therefore a fast-flowing cognitive simulation, a passage with a lot of linking verbs will slow your reader down, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Stylistically, you might decide that it's important for your fiction to create vivid spaces for your characters to play in. Maybe that's what you love best about fiction. And amen. I've read some stunning pieces of writing that slowed things down and took me on a pleasant, meandering walk through dark green fields covered in violets to a murmuring brook with silver fish floating over a delightfully hued amber stones. You're going to need a few linking verbs to do that in your writing. Being aware of the difference, though, is a great feather to have in your cap. Am I pressing play or holding pause? A final thing to say about linking verbs is that there are far fewer linking verbs than action verbs. You may even find it helpful, if you are a newer writer, to have a list of linking verbs handy if you're describing a place, an object, or a character's looks or feelings. You can easily find some good lists of linking verbs online. Remember, our focus is plot in the next few lessons, so as much as we're going to need those linking verbs, especially when we start talking about space, the subject for now is on how to get our fiction moving, how to create a temporal sequence in the simulation of our story world. That means action. That means action verbs. That's how we get our story moving, and there are a lot of ways to make that happen, which we'll explore in the next lesson. That wasn't so hard, was it? Who knew grammar could be so easy and useful to a writer? Go figure.
An infinite array of events can happen in a dynamic story world. This makes it difficult to categorize the way a story can change from state to state. Action verbs can cue a reader to simulate literally anything. The sun exploded. Oh no. Row won a million dollars. That's fantastic. Good for Row, that lucky so and so. A massive storm rode up on Athena's port bow. Better turn right, guys. Really, I mean anything. And it's not just infinity in the real world sense that astronomers try to impress us with when they talk about how big the actual universe is. Our fictional universe is much bigger and much cooler because it can have anything the real universe has in it, and more. We've got dragons and robots, hell, even dragon bots. Tell me that idea wouldn't get Ro a million more imaginary dollars. Or better yet, gods versus monsters versus dragon bots. It's a veritable cornucopia of ideas for the next summer blockbuster. You get the point. When we talk plot, literally anything can happen. So how do we even begin to think about something so vast as that in a useful way? We'll get to ways we can think of events that make for interesting stories shortly. First, let's take some time to consider how different actions and events can change your story world, because if we look closely, we'll find important distinctions that can produce major differences in the type of story you're trying to tell. We might think of these distinctions as tools for corralling the infinite into manageable chunks, and I'm going to discuss these distinctions as possible ways a story world can change state. Instantaneous versus gradual changes. Well, that sounds easy enough, Ro. Is all this stuff going to be so obvious? Some will, sure. And other concepts will seem very obscure. But it's worth talking about obvious distinctions sometimes, because seemingly obvious distinctions often yield drastically different results. Let's look at a few ways we can think about these distinctions that might help your writing. Boom. Car blows up on a street corner. There are ten people nearby. That's an instantaneous change that has irrevocably altered your story world in a dynamic way. The woman closest to the blast was killed instantly. Maybe she's not your protagonist, or maybe she is. A significant instantaneous event can really alter how you choose to tell a story. Maybe you start with the blast and go back to the events leading up to the blast. Or maybe the blast hasn't gone off yet and your protagonist, that lady closest to the blast, is the technician from the bomb squad who's been running around the city making all kinds of changes to the story world to try and keep that bomb from going off. A deadline like that can offer your reader a high sensation of suspense if the reader knows it's coming, or that kind of instantaneous change, if it's not presented to the reader in advance, can surprise the reader, keeping them very curious as to what happened and what's going on in the aftermath. On the other hand, the Carlisle family is rushing to deal with a terrible situation of their own. The Stratford River is overflowing its banks and rising fast, and they're in the floodplain. Oh no. And they have to get out of the house before everything gets washed away. Do they have time to go back inside for the family photos? Great Aunt Josephine's paintings? What about Grampy Dean? He's sleeping in the back room. If we play around with these distinctions, we can see that these different types of changes will make for a different type of situation, one where the suspense is going to have a gradual build-up to a definite climax, and another where the tension is constant, but maybe not so high as the moment the timer on the bomb gets to five seconds. Bounded versus unbounded changes. Both of the above distinctions deal with changes we can draw a fairly clear boundary for, the story world before and after the bomb blast, and the story world before and after the house gets washed away. What if the change in your story world has no border in time and space? Take puberty, for example. There's a story for you. Some of the great novels of all time are concerned with the theme coming of age. The Germans even have a ridiculous word for that. Bildungsroman, if you are interested. And also, are there any German words that aren't ridiculous? Flupergleite. The thing about a Bildungsroman is that it's all but impossible to pull a moment out of the story where, aha, Jane Eyre is now a woman. And what an amazing woman. But how is it interesting if there's no one bounded event to suddenly and irrevocably change Jane's story world? What is it that makes a coming-of-age story work? In the case of Jane Eyre, it's the long succession of smaller changes in the story world, some gradual, some instantaneous, some with boundaries, some without, 
and they all add up to a rich masterpiece about a girl growing into a woman, and I'm pretty sure puberty's in there somewhere. Happenings. M. Night Shyamalan films aside, happenings are a useful distinction to know about. You may have noticed a commonality in the examples I gave above. I left out the axe-wielding maniacs, cheating husbands, and drunk-driving aunts. All the examples above are happenings. They're changes in the story world where time, unexpected events, and acts of nature impose changes on the characters in the story world. Happenings just happen. Things like tornadoes, earthquakes, wars, terrorist attacks, swarms of killer bees, or yes, puberty. These things happen to your characters. It's important to consider when you're writing a story that involves a happening that a major part of the suspense for your reader simulating the story will be in finding out how your characters react when a crisis beyond their control imposes its will on those characters. A favorite story of mine from my fiction workshop days was about a rock singer finally getting back on stage after a long bout of depression in the aftermath of a terrible breakup. He's halfway through his first song, and who should walk into the center of the crowd? You guessed it, the X. And the main drama of the story concerned the singer, the ex, and the consequences of their failed relationship. But this story took place in the Southwest, and looming in the background of this story was a massive wildfire, crawling its way down toward the city like an orange, glowing, smoldering menace. The fire added suspense and placed an uncertain time limit on the former couple's attempts to reconcile. It was a beautiful story and it was a great use of a happening to add both tension and symbolic meaning to a love story that otherwise might have been ordinary. We've now covered floods, explosions, earthquakes, swarms of killer bees, and how could I forget, dragon bots. But if you can believe it, as I alluded to earlier, that's the easy and less interesting half of the equation. We haven't talked about the fun part yet, the people in our story world. That's where things get really interesting. But that's not for this lesson, folks. You're going to have to wait for the next installment. Always give your audience something to look forward to. That's called suspense. Earlier I discussed the importance of all the compartments in your writer's toolbox, especially how you shouldn't neglect one at the expense of the others. The example I gave was focusing on character to the detriment of plot, but in this lesson I'm going to be talking an awful lot about characters. And the reason for this is simple. As much as you shouldn't focus on only one or the other, this chapter will show you that you really can't disentangle plot from character. They're hopelessly intertwined. Much of what you'll remember about your favorite characters has to do with the ways they acted within the story world, the things they did, the ways they responded to happenings and got out of tricky situations. Here, we're going to explore the other half of how the story changes states. Not the story imposing on the characters, but the characters acting to change the state of the story world. Goals. A character with a goal won't change the story world without acting, but goals do help to explain a lot of the ways characters change the state of the story world. So it's worth mentioning a few quick things about goals. A simple way to think about a character's goal is as her desire to change something about the story world. When we discuss action shortly, we'll see that a goal doesn't need to be the driving force in a story. It can be almost insignificant. Sometimes, though, a character's goal is the main plot element in a story. You may have heard a character's goal in a goal-driven story referred to as the MacGuffin, which I think was a bit of a derisive joke that became so ubiquitous that the term is stuck, and the original meaning has faded away behind it. Essentially, the MacGuffin is the major something a character is after, assuming they know what they're after. Poor lost Dorothy just wanting to go home, the one ring in the Trixie Hobbitses who stole it from us, precious, or that dreamy senior Jake Ryan. Plans. A good way to set about achieving a goal is to have a plan, 
In a narrative sense, plans are a calculated set of events undertaken by a character to change the current state of the story world into a goal-fulfilled state. For example, in order to have a donut, Homer must walk across the room to where the donuts are. Aw, but that's so far! And that's all a character needs in order to have a plan, a desire that prompts them to act in a specific way. Admittedly, a reader probably doesn't care that much about whether Homer gets his donut or not, even if Homer cares a lot. Plans must involve risk in order for a story to be suspenseful. A plan to get milk at the grocery store is inherently mundane and uninteresting. Unless, of course, there are zombies along the way. Then a character better have a bulletproof plan. Risk in a story comes from both luck, or lack thereof, as in when poor Rebecca's armored war wagon got a flat tire in the middle of a crowd of zombies on the way to get milk for her Captain Crunch. Or risk can come from the actions of other characters, like the slightly crazy looking but friendly guy with the bazooka who comes along to seemingly save Rebecca's day. I'm not so sure I would fully trust him if I were her. Actions. Goals and plans don't change the state of the story world of themselves. A character needs to take action in order to do that. Actions can be as mundane as a character getting up to get a donut, or as dangerous as going out in a zombie apocalypse to get milk for some Captain Crunch. An action is something that is deliberately initiated by the character, and we can almost always at least infer that there's a goal plus plan motivating the action. For example, when Larry goes to the water fountain to drink, it's probably safe to assume that Larry didn't like being thirsty, had the desire to change the state in which he was thirsty, formed a plan to get a drink of water to quench that thirst, and go figure, off to the water fountain went Larry. Moves. A move, in a narrative sense, is an action that involves both a high priority goal and a high risk of failure. If you find yourself reading a story and thinking, I don't think trying to escape that Soviet gulag is going to work out so well for Dmitri, but I'm really pulling for him. It's probably safe to call that a move. The great thing about moves is that they generate a tremendous amount of suspense in a reader when they simulate the scenario. Moves will help keep your reader engaged and turning the pages. In the last two lessons, we've been directly discussing the main ways it's possible for a story world to change from one state to another. We've also indirectly been discussing the next important aspect of plot, perhaps the most important aspect of all. A changing state is about a dynamic world, and a lot of theorists have proposed that this alone is the key to plot. Causality, they say. One thing happens which causes another thing to happen, and so on, until the story has played itself out. Picture this, though. Rowe reads a narrative theory book that says exactly that. Plot is all about causality. And that's what makes a story a story. Roe, ever the smartass, thinks, well, I'll just give the audience what they want then. A pure, unadulterated dose of causality they won't be able to look away from. Riddled with one action verb after another after another. What a mental simulation. There's no way a reader will be able to put my book down. Roe then sits down to write the following story. Domino A knocks over Domino B, which in turn knocks over Domino C. And that domino hits domino D, toppling into domino E, and by this point, if you haven't skipped over the part of this sentence with domino C, D, and E, you are already plotting your escape. A story needs to be dynamic for it to be a story, yes, but it must be dynamic in a manner that is interesting. And X causes Y causes Z isn't interesting unless X is a gunfight, Y is the retaliation, and Z is the reckoning that settles the matter once and for all. We'll talk interesting next. If I gave you the task of trying to come up with a list of all the interesting things, you'd have a pretty long list, certainly one too long to be useful, and in the process of compiling it, I bet you'd have a hard time of coming up with a definitive list too. After all, are fire engines interesting? That probably depends on who you ask. <laughs> 
If you're a five-year-old boy, you might be hard-pressed to find another thing in the world more interesting than a fire engine. But then, there are five-year-old boys who couldn't care less about fire engines. They're into ants, or Legos, or Gasp, maybe even dolls. We might be able to agree that a fire engine is a lot more interesting with its lights on speeding across town to a fire, but that's not necessarily a given. I have a friend who's a birder, and there isn't a thing in the world that grabs her attention like the birds and the trees. We'll be walking along, having a conversation, and suddenly I realize that I've been walking with myself and talking to myself for the last 30 seconds because some yellow-throated warbler fluttered its way into the begonia bush as we just passed by. To those poor folks in the arboretum, really, I assure you, I'm not crazy, and very sorry I frightened your little ones. As for the birds, though, Ro could take them or leave them. They don't grab me and pull me in, and they certainly don't captivate me the way they've captivated my friend since she was five years old. I say all this to say that it is a difficult task figuring out what's interesting, to whom, and why. And though I can't say I've nailed it down to a precise science, if there is such a thing, I have got a very good idea of what reliably grabs people. Later in this lesson, I'll present you with a list of plot elements so magnetic you'll find them spread throughout stories in every culture and era across all reaches of the globe. For now, I'm going to begin with a story. I attended a novelist's reading a few years back, a very talented writer I was friendly with. He read several sections from his novel, and all were wonderfully written. The crowd was filled with the smarmy literary types you would picture novelists hanging around with, Rose friends, basically. And a crowd like that really listens. If you're in the club, they really give you their full attention. During the first two sections of this reading, the audience listened attentively and politely. You can probably picture it, a hipster or two stroking a mustache. A girl with black-rimmed glasses has her head cocked to one side, listening, and working to listen. And perhaps to my point, I don't recall what those two sections of the novel were about, specifically. I know they were well-written and good, because I remember the novel as a whole. And I know the writer doesn't write bad work. He just doesn't. He's really good. But the third section, friends. Oh my. The character was a boy of about ten, back in simpler times when men were men. And his father was putting his son through the paces by taking him to the boxing gym. This story was about this kid's first fight. And from the moment that bell rang in the story, the energy in the room was completely transformed. People went from listening politely to involuntarily transfixed, pupils dilated, heartbeats raced, the head cocked sideways, straightened up and leaned forward. People took deep breaths. It was captivating. Same writer, same novel, different chapter, different stuff. Some things grab, and they do so so reliably enough that this friend of mine had tricked a room full of haughty academic and literary types into hanging onto the edges of their seats while a bunch of imaginary third graders beat the crap out of each other. So sophisticated. I joke, but it's to a point. These weren't the type of people who order MMA on pay-per-view. If you ask them about it, maybe 5% would admit to ever watching a fight, but only as a guilty pleasure, you see. My friend, the author, could have done that in any room with that story, because some things just grab people at a very deep level and don't let go. Violence is one of those things. And maybe we don't know why, and we probably don't like it. But if we're in the room when it's going down, it is immediately and magnetically captivating. As a writer, it will pay both literally and figuratively to know what grabs. See Martin, George R.R., R., or perhaps our old friend Stephen. But it also pays for the top literary writers, too. They just write about the same things in different ways. The most acclaimed novelists and stories of all time are filled with similar plot elements, danger and violence, sex and revenge. We just need to dig underneath the superficial situations being portrayed to understand why. I'll give an example of what I mean by this, and it may sound a bit weird at first. I read a lot, I know, shocker. One time I found myself reading an anthropology paper about a tribe of hunter-gatherers in South America, where the adolescent boys engage in a bizarre ritual. They live in an area of the rainforest that is home to a species of bullet ants that apparently possess the fiercest sting of any stinging insect in the world. And you might think these boys would stay way the hell away from these ants, and in their everyday life they probably do, but on occasion, 
The tribe weaves mittens out of palm fronds, fills them with bullet ants, and these boys stick their hands inside and allow the bullet ants to bite them over and over and over, and they take it stone-faced, never reacting to the excruciating pain. Not Rose's idea of a good time, I'll tell you that much. How about another bizarre ritual? Byron is from Long Island. He's been working a job as a bagger at a grocery store after school in order to pay for the limo and tuxedo he's renting to take Tracy Stanitz to the junior prom. See the connection? On the surface, these two behaviors seem totally different. In isolation, they bear no resemblance whatsoever. But what I didn't tell you about the adolescents in the Amazon is that the bullet ant ritual is a rite of passage that allows the boys to take part as an adult in their society. Their ability to tolerate pain demonstrates the kind of toughness a warrior tribe values, just as Western cultures might value hard work and an ability to hold down a steady job. The commonality here is that both young men are engaging in a rite of passage, regardless of how different its surface-level presentation is. Take similar events at face value, and they can seem as widely divergent as bow ties and bullet ants. Deep down, though, there's something meaningful going on. That's what I'm talking about by getting underneath the surface of the individual actions. It's about looking at the deeper meaning of the situation to figure out what's grabbing the deeply human and making it go. If you can get a bead on that and incorporate these deeper level plot elements into your fiction, you'll have everyone from the smarmiest intellectual types to the fun-loving surfers to the monster truck-driving grandmas engrossed in your work. I won't dig too much further here because as you can probably tell, I could go on and on like this for hours. I will say that if you're interested in the connection between biology and behavior and would like a place to start, Robert Sapolsky's entire Introduction to Biological Behaviorism class is on YouTube and quite accessible to a well-rounded layperson. Go get yourself a Stanford education with a genius professor in the comfort of your living room. Ro did. Without any more blathering, I give you Ro's magnetic plot elements. They are sex, death, danger, goals, power, wealth, conflict, violence, deceit, transgression, betrayal, revenge, mystery, dilemma, strangers, quest. I would be remiss if I didn't expound upon these magnetic plot elements at least a little. If I don't miss the mark, by virtue of the magnetic nature of those categories, I'll bet that at least I have your attention, if not concurrence. You're going to want these things in your stories in some form. Remember that we're trying to change the story world, and we're trying to do it in a way that will interest readers, ideally in the same way my friend captured everyone's attention so magnetically at that book reading. Why do these things grab people, though? The short answer is that they are part of our deep evolutionary past, and if they weren't, we wouldn't be here. Humans, like all animals, have only so much attention to give their environment. Thus, when our ancestors walked across a landscape with countless things that could kill them, and wanted to, mind you, we stood a far better chance with a developed hierarchy of attention to help us figure out where we should be looking for the next threat to our life, or, on the other hand, the next opportunity to improve it. Our eyes are excellent at doing this for us when it comes to predators. Even my birder friend wouldn't be looking at the yellow-throated warblers if there were a bear or a snake nearby. Similarly, our environment includes other people and how they relate to one another. Our ancestors needed to know who had status and why, who was rising and who was falling, who they could trust and who was going to stab them in the back. These are all things that people had to be watchful for throughout our long history, from the savannah to the city square. I could easily write a book on each element and the reasons it grabs people, complete with a comparative analysis of the major pieces of literature that make use of each element as well as the biological and psychological foundations. If you think I don't have pieces of this already conceived in my head, you haven't been paying attention. Mercifully for you, though, we have a different objective today. These are your tools. Here's how you use them. So what I'll do instead is say a few words on each magnetic plot element with a few thoughts to consider. Sex. E.L. James has sold over 150 million books. I don't mean the following to belittle her, because my hat's off. That's a stunning accomplishment. But if you think sex isn't deeply magnetic, then you're forced to admire James for her lyrical prose. 
It bears mentioning that romantic love, too, not just the erotic kind, falls into this category. If it draws the interest of the character or characters, both the hint of sex, whenever two single-ish characters notice each other, and the actual presence of sexual intercourse on the page, are magnetic. All a reader needs is a mere sniff of sexual tension for this element to be present in the story world. Death. One of the reasons many researchers believe we're so captivated by stories is that they're relaying invaluable information about our environment, free of cost, so to speak. In other words, we enjoy watching characters die so we don't have to. The mere threat of death catches readers' attention. Likewise, stories that dramatize the aftermath of a death grab our interest as well. If there's one human universal, it is death. And the significance of the event makes us curious about how we can delay it as long as possible, and how we should behave when it befalls someone else. Danger. Doesn't only have to relate to physical harm. There were dangers with having children out of wedlock in Victorian England, or in being the social outcast at the ball for that matter. Danger can come in an almost infinite number of forms on the page, from rattlesnakes in the bushes, to a shady-looking character, to a stock market crash. Dangers abound. Cueing it can often be as simple as starting a story with something like, there was a rattlesnake in the bushes. Goal. Goals, too, come in numerous forms. When I think of a goal as a magnetic element, though, I'm referring to something major. To escape the collapsing tunnel. To find a lost city or to get into Harvard. If your character is invested in a goal in a major way, your reader will come along as well, rooting for them in the process, if the goal is worthy. Goals may be the deepest of all the magnetic elements, I suspect. Imagine the brain of a hunting mammal millions of years ago following the scent of its dinner all the way from the faintest hint of prey in the breeze, down a trail to a stomach full of meat and a brain full of dopamine. The roots of our narrative brain, perhaps? Power. Power concerns who's on top of the heap. Narratives that successfully engage power as a plot element consistently shift who's got it. People like to see the powerful fall and the small go big. In any case, there needs to be a thread of movement up or down the scale to grab interest. The unjust king pushes the people below him one too many times. Ahab orders his men to get after that whale. When a powerful antagonist wields power unjustly, it seems to set the story world out of balance until they get their comeuppance. On the other hand, it's magnetic to see a hard-working and worthy protagonist work their way to the top. A boy pulls a sword from a stone. Watching characters negotiate this critical part of human social interaction helps readers get a sense of the lay of the land in their own lives, and it keeps them reading to find out more. Wealth is not the point of a money story. It's how that wealth moves the characters up and down the social ladder. That's why it's the MacGuffin. The money itself has no inherent value beyond what it can do for the character's well-being and social standing. This category concerns life-changing wealth. Whenever big amounts of money are on the page, so are your reader's eyes. Conflict. We'll cover this in greater depth, along with Dilemma, because conflict is a complex convergence of two or more characters opposing psyches clashing in the real world. And we love watching that. But unlike most magnetic elements, a good conflict requires a little extra work to get it going. Sex, wealth, violence, and goals can be magnetic on the page without much setup at all. Dana and Chris were in the back room getting it on, rolling naked on the mountain of cash they'd stolen in a heist that morning. See what I mean? Violence. Any portrayal of violence, or even the threat of it, will catch a reader's attention in the same way a fight does in real life. Two drunk dads throwing punches at a baseball game, feuding divas tussling over a tiara at the prom, Napoleon Bonaparte marches his mortars towards Moscow. Violence grabs interest, in any form. It's the potential consequence whenever things go bad, and the rules surrounding violence are important to know. Is it right for that third grader to throw a finishing blow at a weaker, already staggering opponent? Watch and find out. Deceit can cost a character dearly if there's something big at stake, even if it's just losing trust. Getting fooled can cost time, money, friendships, and alter life trajectories. 
and even the trajectories of nations irrevocably. When fiction is about navigating the social landscape, deceit is easily one of the most common pitfalls. Sometimes a narrator will bring the reader in on the deception, choosing to place the suspense in knowing that the oblivious character is heading for a fall. Other times, the narrator might choose to surprise the reader along with the character. In either case, people pay close attention to who's playing the game of life fairly and who's not. We pay attention in stories as well. Transgression Breaking social rules, especially in fiction, can cost a character dearly. Whether a transgression is clearly delineated by law or implicit in the culture, suspense is immediately generated when a character crosses a line. It is imperative for people to understand the social consequences of defying predominant culture. Interestingly, transgressive suspense seems transferable, by which I mean if you watch a narrative immersed in a culture where the transgression is not as severe a taboo, a modern American reading The Scarlet Letter, for example, the transgression still has the potential to hold interest. I suspect this is because we're more drawn to learning about the response of the culture than the particulars of the transgression. Betrayal I draw a distinction between deceit and betrayal because it's an important one. If your enemy tricks you on the battlefield, it's expected. That's deceit. If your best friend steals your spouse, you've been betrayed. Betrayal is about a deep breach of trust plus deceit. The knife of a friend cuts twice as deep. Additionally, a character can deeply betray their own values and beliefs without ever deceiving themselves about what they're doing. Self-destruction can have a powerful hold. Revenge Nothing gets the blood hot like the old revenge story. You killed my father. Prepare to die. And no motivation may be easier to explain. Causality at its finest here. Domino B is coming right back at you, eh? This too goes deep into our history. On an evolutionary time scale, cops are a new thing. What an innovation, too. Maybe not in books, but in real life, boy does 911 beat a blood feud. When a bad guy does something bad in a story, though, readers can't wait to see them get their just desserts. Mystery. Everyone loves a good mystery, but why? A mystery of its own, perhaps. My theory is that this has to do with the breaking of the status quo without explanation. Is this unexplained blip in the fabric of my environment a threat to my life, well-being, family status, etc.? When our known environment suddenly has a new and unexplained wrinkle in it, we'd be fools not to pay attention. Your readers sure will. And this isn't just about who did the murder in scene one. It's about the man in scene four who lights his own house on fire with no motive. It may also be a much subtler situation readers can't explain, like a strange sound in the woods or even a magical circumstance or happening. Mysteries concern what we think we know about people and the environments they dwell in. Dilemma. Dilemmas, too, will cover in greater depth. This is about inner turmoil, how a character reckons with an inner struggle or an impossible choice. We like to watch characters engage in dilemmas, presumably because it's a free pass at a high-stakes game we don't have to pay the consequences for losing. Stranger. This is the mystery in human form here to disrupt a settled social circle and bring havoc to your town. Whether it's the new kid in school or a devilishly charismatic traveler in town to sell trombones, the stranger takes a known, settled social environment and turns it upside down. Whenever a new character appears on the horizon, readers take note. Quest. Gilgamesh, Jason, Odysseus, Rasselas, Dorothy, Frodo, Luke, Katniss. I could go on listing, but you catch my drift. This story is old and new, as eternal as the glory a protagonist gains by venturing out into the unknown territory and bringing back something of value. Perhaps most importantly, the prestige that comes with going where the timid dare not tread. A few words more about what it is exactly I'm talking about here, because you know how much Roe loves specificity. You could think of these elements as types of stories, the deepest layer of our evolutionary roots stretching far down into our animal brain. The magnetic plot elements I listed here are not plots per se. As I mentioned at the outset of this section, plot is a category that catches all stuff that goes on in the story. Shortly, we'll get into exactly what I mean when I say a plot, 
That will give you a helpful framework for thinking about when and where your plots are complete and working, or might have holes that need to be patched. What magnetic plot elements are, though, are categories of plot types. There's that confounding word again, categories, and admittedly the fuzziness of borders reappears. Believe me, a couple literary scholars could spend hours debating whether a cheating character is more of a deceiver or a betrayer, but it isn't clear how that would be a useful exercise for a writer. What do we get out of categorizing changes in the story world into magnetic plot elements? A few words on this as well. As we know, categorizing anything is an imperfect business, but there's a good reason our brains are built to categorize. It helps us to cut down on thinking time by grouping items with similar attributes. It can help us to pick out types of plot constraints that are common in a quest narrative versus a stranger story. That will help us to place appropriate obstacles in our character's way. Ultimately, these categories are a tool for us to use to help us hit our target a story moving in our reader's brain that grabs the reader's interest. There's one final useful point here that also relates to the porousness of borders. If a wife cheats on her husband, or vice versa, how might we categorize that? Sex, betrayal, transgression, dilemma, and danger are all good places to start. Human actions aren't always neatly categorizable, and neither are stories. But as a tool, the fact that this action falls into five magnetic categories might help to explain why a story about a cheating spouse is inherently more tellable than your average couple getting it on under normal circumstances. If we consider that certain human actions are more suspense-laden than others, magnetic plot elements are a decent, if imperfect, tool for thinking about why. Again, I'm not talking about algebra here, but it helps to know what cognitive roots you're trying to tickle with your story. You could write the most beautiful narrative about a character who goes out birding and sees a yellow-throated warbler, and if there aren't any magnetic plot elements, only my friend and her fellow birders will care enough to read it. Make seeing this bird that character's lifelong goal, throw in a few dangerous obstacles, a dilemma, and a stranger who's a potential love interest, and you'll have everyone's hippocampus firing like crazy. You might even make Roe care about yellow-throated warblers. And I know at least one person that'll make very excited. We begin this lesson with an idea of what's interesting to our readers and why. This lesson is less about technique than philosophy, or perhaps a better way to think about it is as a cognitive framework for approaching the task at hand. It presents the foundation for thinking about plot, pragmatically, and strategically. Although we've talked about how to write an interesting story, the target isn't fundamentally writing an interesting piece of fiction. The real target, if we're being precise, and we are now, is the brain of another human being. You're trying to compose cues for a cognitive simulation that will pull another person out of her day with all the errands and work and kids and bills and mothers-in-law and broken computers and doctor's appointments and draw her from that little life into your little musings, you arrogant bastard, you. I kid, but only a little. Our target, that other brain, is like all other human brains. It has more or less the same neuroanatomy and neurochemistry. The same processes that hold your sister's attention hold the attention of the subway conductor, you, and the guy cutting lumber in the Canadian Rockies. We're looking to grab that attention by generating interest with something magnetic enough to make them curious about your little musings. If you hadn't already guessed from the title of this lesson, the tool we're going to be using to do that is suspense. It's the most important tool in your writer's toolbox. A lack of it in your musings is what turns your book into a doorstop. Learn how to create it and manage it, and you'll save your book that sad fate. Think of suspense as the adhesive to hold your reader's interest. You always want to have a little glue on every page. And this is such an important tool that we should discuss it in detail, 
because, again, understanding of this all-important component of fiction is going to help us understand how to hit our target, brains. In common parlance, suspense is a word we associate with the summer blockbuster or the latest James Patterson novel, and rightly so. Those narratives are well-crafted artifacts designed to get a lot of brains to intensely experience the feeling we most associate with the word suspense. Yes, but you clever listeners know by now that words are categories that catch a collection of fuzzy things that are all somewhat similar, and the general definition of suspense is drawn in too fine a circle by far. Most people think of suspense in this small context as a narrative device that keeps you glued to your seat or turning pages in a thriller, but it's not a narrative device at all. It's an emotional experience, a feeling, the sensation you get when you don't know the outcome and something's at stake. These books and movies we categorize as suspense are just particularly geared toward provoking this sensation. You experience suspense all the time outside fiction. Just think about it. While waiting for your sister to have her baby, while running through an airport trying to make a short connection, when your kid has a chance to score a goal at a peewee soccer game, when there's a wildfire in the hills near the lake where you vacation, when there's a snowstorm and you're not quite sure they'll cancel school, when a crazy guy starts shouting on the train, you're an old pro at experiencing suspense, and soon you'll be a pro at generating it too. We feel suspense when we read or watch movies, the same way we feel sadness when a character dies, or euphoria when he finally, after all that fussing about, gives in to his desire and tells that girl that he can't live without her, and they kiss and just, ah. You're trying to get a brain to do that, to experience the tension that goes along with not knowing an outcome and wanting to. Fortunately for us, if we know what we're aiming at, it's not super difficult. We do it naturally with our characters. Robert Sapolsky, the brilliant neurobiologist I referenced in the last lesson, lists this as one of the main things that sets us apart from other primates. It's a tremendous feat of cognition. One example he gives is of Picasso's painting of a horse fleeing its barn during the firebombing of Guernica and the emotional effect this painting is capable of generating in a person. If you really think about it, Sapolsky says, there's no way that object should produce any effect in us. A piece of canvas, covered with dried oil blotches that very roughly resemble a fictional animal of another species we bear no relation to and have no business caring about at all? Still, somehow this painting reliably affects people emotionally. We may not know exactly how, why, and when humans acquired this ability, but we do know that we do it, and we do it easily and early. Developmental psychologists have long since documented that babies reliably ascribe narrative roles to shapes like triangles, circles, and squares, and experience positive or negative emotion towards these characters, depending on whether that square was the good guy or the bad guy of the scene portrayed. We are naturals at ascribing emotions to fictional representations, and underpinning all of those emotions is the suspense that keeps us adhered to the simulation, whether it's circles and squares, burning horses, or the latest James Patterson thriller so packed to the brim with suspense that we named a genre after it. You might be prompted to ponder, as I did for many years, that if suspense is really an emotion, and a key one at that, wouldn't we have a name for this emotion? one that is foundational and could be measured neurochemically and could be traced back evolutionarily to very primitive animal brains? I wonder about stuff like that, and occasionally, whilst reading books about the brain, I come across the answers to such questions. In this case, I found the answer in the latest book from the aforementioned Robert Sapolsky. He calls this emotion stress. Yes, stress. But isn't stress a bad thing? Why would you want your reader to experience stress? According to Sapolsky, whether stress is good or bad really depends on the amount of stress and the context. He puts it like this. We love stress that is mild and transient and occurs in a benevolent context. The stressful menace of a roller coaster ride is that it will make us queasy, not that it will decapitate us. It lasts for three minutes, not three days. We love that kind of stress. Clamor for it. Pay to experience it. What do we call that optimal amount of stress? Being engaged, engrossed, and challenged. Being stimulated. Playing. 
The core of psychological stress is loss of control and predictability, but in benevolent settings, we happily relinquish control and predictability to be challenged by the unexpected, a dip in the roller coaster tracks, a plot twist, a difficult line drive heading our way, an opponent's unexpected chess move. Surprise me, this is fun. The complete absence of stress is aversely boring. Moderate, transient stress is wonderful. Various aspects of brain function are engaged, glucocorticoid levels in that range enhance dopamine release, rats work at pressing levers in order to be infused with just the right amount of glucocorticoids. We love the right amount of stress. Would wither without it. That kind of stress sounds an awful lot like the feeling we were discussing earlier, you know, like when you're about to miss your connection at the airport or your kid is about to score a goal. Stress. Suspense. Sapolsky even mentions a literal plot twist as a source of stress. Good enough. But I'm here to tell you that if your plot is well constructed, it's not just a twist in it that will cue your readers to experience that Goldilocks zone of glucocorticoid-inducing stress. Your whole plot will, from start to finish. And yes, you do want to stress your readers out a little. Stress and suspense may not be exactly synonymous, but it's clear from Sapolsky's description of stress and our understanding of suspense in a general sense that we're barking up the same tree, at least cognitively speaking. If our target is another brain, what we're trying to do is get that reader's brain to experience the benevolent stress that Sapolsky describes, and to stimulate the resultant dopamine release associated with it. In order to do that, we're going to need our readers to experience suspense, narratively speaking, that is. So what do I mean when I say suspense in a narrative sense? Not surprisingly, for readers you're overwhelmingly familiar with by now, narrative suspense is tricky to define. One good definition comes from the brilliant narrative theorist Mary Laura Ryan, who describes it as the reader's desire for the knowledge that awaits at the end of narrative time. And for reasons mentioned earlier, I think even this is a definition drawn too narrow as well, because it's not just knowledge we're after when we consume a narrative, and it's not just at the end. We desire to witness the events that have grabbed our interest and experience the emotions of the characters involved along the way. We enjoy anticipating the moments that lead up to a climax and resolution, and we like to hope for a certain outcome, as much as we enjoy learning the canonical outcome that differs from all the possible outcomes we might anticipate. All of these experiences are suspense too. Suspense is the glue that holds our interest in a story, whether there's a bomb on the bus, or a little girl loses her teddy bear at the grocery store, or two old friends who have lived their entire lives together are saying goodbye one last time. Emotions are messy, mysterious things, cognitively speaking, and we've only just begun to entangle the mess they make in our brain. And I'm not sure language helps cognitive scientists all that much in this regard. If you take love, for example, it's a word we use in English, very generally, to describe a feeling we have about our kids, our spouses, our siblings, our dogs, a season, a chocolate cupcake, Tchaikovsky, and Game of Thrones. You know you do. Yet another example of the porousness of borders. We wouldn't feel the exact same sensations if we were naked in a shopping mall versus giving a wrong answer aloud in a math class and we certainly wouldn't feel that sensation with the same intensity in those differing circumstances. But we'd use the same word, embarrassment, because it's kind of close enough that other people will know what you mean by that word when you use it. They've probably had roughly the same feeling in their life, too. Most of the words we have for emotions are just decent enough categories that they convey the general idea, but imperfectly, and never with much resolution concerning the intensity of the experience. You'd experience the fear intensity of a great white shark from a boat 50 yards away very differently from that same fear if it were three feet from you and you were in the water. I mention this to a purpose. Suspense will be appropriately diffused throughout a narrative in a similar manner. If the narrative is well-crafted, that is. That's why you feel the climax coming and know when it's happening. That shark is right there. We'll cover why suspense is necessarily varied over the course of a story, and we'll talk about how to do this appropriately in the next lesson. For now, I'm going to leave you with some good news and some bad news, and then some hope for dealing with the bad. The good news is this. 
People love suspense. They love it. They lap it up in every form, whether it comes from sports or politics or movies or gossip. If you can give them a little, you'll be a star. And one surefire way to do that is with a good cognitive simulation in written form. In a very cool and not widely thought about aspect of stories is their remote past, the tribe's storyteller at the campfire or the wandering bard coming to town. There's a related psychological phenomenon called behavioral contagion. If a few people begin to look in the same direction at the same time, there's a very good chance that others will too, and the bigger the crowd, the more reliably people's attention will be drawn to something. If a thousand people are looking at something, there's a strong chance it's worth your attention as well. With stories, the phenomenon is the same. Over time, a storyteller who generated enough narrative suspense reliably drew interest from a few listeners, and those few drew a small crowd. That crowd drew more and more people the bigger it got. Over time, we've built technological structures that signal value for stories that reliably generate interest worthy of a listener or observer's time. These signals tell people that giving up their time and even money to experience this story is a valuable trade. Just the way a gathering of a thousand people in the amphitheater used to signal the same. Storytelling is ultimately a social activity at its roots, a speaker and an audience. And the size of the audience, and the audience's manner, signaled the story's worth. Now, structures like movie theaters, bookstores, publishing houses, and even the physical existence of a book itself, exude a value signifying that the story within is worth something. This is important because the book itself, the storytelling situation, just like a gathered crowd in days gone by, presents your reader with a baseline amount of suspense encoded in the storytelling experience. That's the good news. If the book is in a reader's hand, you've got a slice of their interest. Think of this as a grace period. The bad news is this, unless you're Stephen King and your name is on the cover, hi Stephen, you've probably got a name like Roe, and your grace period is very short. It's going to vary from reader to reader. You must carry the reader's feeling of suspense from that grace period, from the opening of the cover and wondering what's inside, to the very first cue of suspense in the story itself. They might give you a page, they might give you two, but unless you're Stephen and they give you 40 on prestige, reputation, and past experience, you're going to have to snatch their attention early. Your words, your cognitive cues, must offer them an experience worth feeling, and it must do it in a way that it glues them to the text, because there are a lot more valuable things they could be doing with their time than reading the musings of a random stranger. You are a telemarketer. That's the bad news. Here's the hope. Narrative suspense, cued early and properly managed through the course of a functioning plot, is one of the most satisfying human experiences we have, and you're going to give your reader just that. We'll discuss what a properly functioning plot looks like next. Thanks for hanging in there. In my long Frankenstein monster definition of a story, I use a more specific descriptor than interesting regarding our cognitive simulation. That descriptor is the hyphenated adjective interest grabbing. In the earlier stages of thinking about this definition, that descriptor was interest catching, but I thought it wasn't quite right because a writer needs to do more than just catch interest, they need to hold interest as well. I settled for the descriptor interest grabbing, which seemed a satisfactory, although still not perfect, compromise. If you don't already think about the words you use with this level of specificity, this may give you an idea of how precise writers should strive to be with the words they use and their connotations. But for now, it will serve as an introduction to the topic at hand, and the main task ahead of us, catching and keeping interest. A well-formed plot will help ensure both.
The lesson on magnetic plot elements concerned the first challenge, catching interest. Here we'll discuss keeping it. I'm going to introduce a structural model as a tool for thinking about plot in general, but most importantly what a plot is and what it is not. First, I'm going to begin with a few sets of cues for you to simulate. Set 1. Juby was starving. It had been over four days since he'd eaten a thing, and all the other chimps who were full had been harassing him non-stop. He was seated at the base of a banana tree, looking up at the fruit hanging there as though it were taunting him. Mace and Ugo were the two who had actually hurt his ankle, hobbling him so severely that he couldn't get up on two legs, though Juby knew he could get up the tree if Mace weren't around. The two older adolescents had been brutal to Juby since his arrival, hurling rocks at him, brandishing large tree branches, and throwing him out of the fruit tree the first time he'd made an attempt to get to the yellowing bunches days earlier. If I were to stop the simulation here and walk away, no doubt you'd be scratching your head and wondering why I stopped. What's up with that, Ro? Poor frickin' Juby is left starving to death in the jungle and you just leave him there? Have you no heart? What do you care, though? If you do, in so far as you do, my answer would be that you immediately recognize Juby is in danger. I used the cues starving four days and hadn't eaten a thing to make you recognize he needs to eat. There are also cues to violence, a past injury, and an implied promise of more if Juby tries to get up to the fruit. These are called plot constraints. More on these as we go along. In this passage, I've done two things. I've introduced a magnetic plot element, and I've begun to constrain the plot. You could call it a danger narrative, or you could call it a goal narrative. It doesn't really matter when the simulation is happening. It's probably both. What does matter is whether your brain is engaged. And I suspect it is, because I've quickly built you a story world that has something at stake in it. Is this a story, though? Your instinct is probably to say no and you probably just kind of feel that this isn't a story in the same way you might feel someone hadn't finished their sentence if they said, I'm going to head over to Roslindale later too. If you've really been paying attention to the previous lessons, you've got a good reason that this passage isn't a story. Did you catch it? No action verbs in the present, folks. This passage is atemporal. Juby never moved just sat right there at the base of that tree and didn't budge. I mean, can you blame him? If Mace doesn't want you to get a banana, you're not getting a banana. Let's see where this goes. Set 2. Mace locked eyes with Juby as he stared up at the fruit. It was clear the biggest of the juveniles wasn't even going to tolerate his looking at the bananas. Juby leaned forward onto three limbs and made his way over to sit behind Sisko, one of the adolescent females in the community. Juby wasn't quite sure about her yet, but it seemed she always had the attention of the bigger juveniles, and she seemed to tolerate his presence far more charitably than the others. As Juby sat, Sisko leaned back slightly, inviting him to groom her shoulder. He leaned forward eagerly and began to work his fingers through the hair on her shoulders and the back of her neck. Juby looked up into the banana tree to see how Mace was reacting to the development. He seemed not to care. Juby looked back at Sisko and continued. If I stop the simulation here, you might be more inclined to call this a story. It probably seems more story-like to you, right? There are developments here. The state of the story changed. And with the suspense cues already in place, you can probably start to piece together what this story is about and where it may go. There's new information here. But that new information isn't happening in a vacuum. You're processing the new information with the assumption that it relates to the cues presented in the first passage, and you're doing this automatically, putting the pieces together. Even so, if I stopped here, no doubt you'd still be left wondering. This passage is not complete. There's a suspense cue, and the reader is beginning to process the information of the story with respect to that cue. There are constraints. We're on our way. Let's see what happens next. Set 3. As Juby continued to groom Sisko over the next 30 minutes, Several other females approached and seemed to become more accepting of his presence. Even Lynx, one of the youngest juvenile males, seemed to warm to him. Mace was still at the top of the banana tree. He'd eaten a few bananas and let out a huff or two, audible to the chimps on the ground below. 
Uggo, on the other hand, was growing agitated. He'd settled at the base of a large banyan tree and was rocking back and forth, grunting in the direction of the group of chimps surrounding Sisko. They all still had their back to him. Uggo kicked the trunk of the banyan tree a few times, looking up toward Mace as he let out a low howl. Sisko didn't get up, but she turned her back far enough to get a look at the smaller of the two big juveniles causing the commotion. Up in the tree, Mace got up in his haunches, clutching the big leaves above him with his hands and keening. Sisko stood in front of Juby now, and the other juveniles began to grunt and huff. Juby stayed low and quiet, turning toward the threat, still keeping his eyes down. If I've done my job correctly here, you probably think you have an idea of what's going to happen now. This simulation probably feels a lot more like a story, too, but not completely. There are a couple major problems here that have yet to be worked out, and I bet you think you have a good idea of how they might get worked out, but you don't know for sure. If I were to continue by providing a set of cues that wildly deviated from what you're expecting, you'd probably not like that at all. I could. That's my prerogative as the author. I could make Mace lumber his chimp ass down to the bottom of that banana tree and sing Bridge Over Troubled Water in the key of G, and there's not a damn thing you could do about it except put the book down. And you would. And that's my point. The cues of a plot need to cohere. We all know what's missing here. Set 4. When the attack came, it was fast. Ugo was there first, trying to work his way around Sisko to Juby who was still low to the ground, baring his teeth and doing his best to stay up on all fours. Soon the group coalesced into a massive shifting ball of fur, teeth, and howling energy, slipping its way toward the gap in the trees between the banyan tree and the greenery behind it. Juby could feel his hair being pulled, and for a moment he felt the sharp sensation of teeth in his lower back. As the group rolled over the crunching leaves, suddenly the whole group fell apart. Sisko and Ugo went bounding off toward the lower valley and after a few sharp howls, Mace followed. The littler chimps pulled themselves to their feet one by one, Lynx shifting his head over his shoulders from side to side as he gazed over to Juby, who was crouched down on all fours, hiding in the bushes. In a flash, Lynx was gone. Juby got up slowly at first, testing his shaking body. Each of his steps toward the opening were slow, but he became steadier as he realized he'd been left behind. He heard a howl somewhere off in the distance, and a few more followed. Juby made a break for the banana tree. Hopping between his good leg and his throbbing arms, he latched onto the trunk with his hands and leapt up the tree, suffering the pain in his ankle in order to keep upright and climbing. As he reached the fruit, he stopped, perching against the trunk and dangling his wounded limb in the open air. He plucked the ripest banana in his reach. He held it in his hands, slowly cracking open the peel, as he scanned the forest floor below. He turned his eyes back to the food in his hand, now peeling quickly. He caught a glimpse of a dark black figure rising into the canopy in the distance, and for a moment, Juby thought he'd been undone. But it wasn't Mace. He could see the outline of Sisko there, and the slightest hint of a knowing smile. A great story? Certainly not. And no doubt there's at least one nerdy primatologist somewhere tearing her hair out and screaming, Seriously, Ro? You ignorant blockhead! Not only is that not even a remotely realistic representation of primate behavior, but banana trees and banyan trees in the same ecosystem? What a disgrace! Surely that's happening. It's a good lesson to learn. You should do your research. But it is a story. And to the screaming primatologist, at least I didn't make the chimps sing Bridge Over Troubled Water. And to the rest of you, come on, admit it, you did kind of care just a little whether that poor wounded chimp got his banana. So what made that a story, and the pieces of it just pieces? A plot, a complete plot that is, has three definite parts. A suspense cue, or introduced plot element, constraints on that cue, and a resolution. Note that suspense in the story increases as more constraints are added closing off potential outcomes until the number of possible outcomes is reduced to a small window of possibilities. Ultimately, a resolution occurs when the question posed by the introduced plot element is answered. That's it, folks, a plot in all its glory. It needs all three parts to be complete, otherwise your reader will know it. You knew after the first set of cues that Juby and the banana tree was not a complete plot, because despite an introduced plot element and a few constraints, 
the suspense that was cued at the start of the story was yet to be resolved and though more constraints were introduced gradually it still wasn't really a completed plot until you knew what happened juby didn't need to get the banana either by the way there are countless complete plots where the resolution is not what the characters or the readers wanted the point is that the constraints and the resolution are processed with respect to the introduced plot element just as you probably suspected that juby was sitting down on the ground the whole time trying to figure out a way to get up that banana tree you would be too if you were starving let's go a little deeper here because it's warranted things aren't quite as simple as they seem remember writing and reading one of these sets of cues is incredibly cognitively complex we know a bit about the introduced plot element already and the resolution more or less speaks for itself the constraints though can be pretty complex what exactly is going on there i could point out specific cues in any story such as i did with the story of juby and his banana tree like when i mentioned that starving cued danger for juby at the start of the story that happens but we're also dealing with a representation of behavior what exactly does it mean when Cisco allows Juby to groom her shoulder? Is this an act of kindness or aggression? A defiant challenge to Mace's authority? It's certainly not specifically delineated in the text because behavior, even animal behavior, is far more complex than the words we use to describe it. Maybe the act is both kindness and aggression, and about ten other things. Certainly, though, it is clear that this moment in the plot changes the state of the story. It constrains the plot in a new way. It removes all the possible outcomes for this story where Juby is completely ignored by the other low-ranking chimps. How this action relates to the introduced plot element, the fact that he's starving and wounded, a reader can't be sure, but it's clear that it does. And it's also clear that this moment in the story pushes the plot toward its resolution by changing the status quo. Again, this isn't algebra. We're talking about inferences and assumptions, so it's not precise. But we can take a closer look at some types of plot constraints that maybe aren't so murky. Consider Juby's action, walking away from the trunk of the banana tree. His motivation is probably to get out of the gaze of Mace, who seems to be annoyed that Juby is looking up at the fruit. Juby has a motivation reduce the possibility of Mace's aggression escalating. His plan is to get away from the tree. It's a low-risk plan that, once he executes it, serves to constrain the story. The fight could have happened there, but it didn't. Juby's action here closes off all possible scenarios that involved an escalation of aggression or violence at that point in the story. There are fewer possible outcomes now. The plot has been constrained. This may open new avenues for the plot, as indeed it did, but it shut doors and moved the story to a new state. Could we consider Juby's grooming Cisco a move? Remember, moves are high-risk actions that offer a severe penalty for failure. I say this one is debatable as a move. It isn't as clearly a move as it would be if Juby decided to climb the banana tree despite his injury and fight Mace in single chimp combat to the death. But it clearly shifts the dynamics of the story, and both Mace and Ugo, the two antagonists, are not happy about it. It constrains the story as well. If Juby limps off into the jungle instead, the possible outcomes involving this community of chimps are closed. Maybe he finds food somewhere else. All those lines of possible outcomes are closed when Juby decides not to limp away, but to walk toward Sisko instead. Moves constrain possible outcomes as well and usually in significant ways. There isn't really a happening that constrains this story. If a storm had kicked up and forced Mace down from the tree, that would be an example of how happenings constrain a plot. There wasn't anything like that here. Imagine, though, if it had started raining bananas. Seriously. Poor, starving Jubies, just sitting there for four days thinking his number's up. He's gonna waste away and go off to chimp heaven. Chimp God thinks, nah, Juby. I have other plans for you. Boom. Banana storm. You probably don't like this idea as a fiction writer, but as a clever reader, you'd be able to identify this plot element as another happening. An unlikely one, sure, but a happening nonetheless. A happening like this would certainly change the dynamic of the story. It would also resolve Juby's primary issue, but it probably wouldn't be all that satisfying a resolution. 
If you've come across the term deus ex machina before, you're probably aware that it refers to an ending where the crisis for the character seems to be solved very cheaply, as though the writer intervenes and plucks their character out of an impossible situation through divine writerly intervention. This would be that, only chimp deus banana machina, something like that. So actions, happenings, and moves act as constraints. That seems pretty obvious. What else? Well, why doesn't Juby just eat the banana at the outset? If we think about it, there are cues that infer things constraining that possible outcome. One example is that the bananas are in the tree and Juby's not. He'd need to climb up there to get them. This is a good example of a setting constraining possible outcomes. The space in the story world often dictates what actions and moves a character can and can't take, and this is one of them. It also dictates that the bananas are in that one specific spot where Mace is as well. It forces the plot to a choke point, constrains it. Another dimension that constrains plot is time, and there's a good example in this story. The cue that Juby hadn't eaten in four days lets the reader know he needs to eat. How long does it take a chimp to starve to death? I mean, you probably don't know that, so it's not a bad idea to add a cue like starving to drive the point home. But even if I hadn't, it would have been evident that Juby was on a short timeline here. And we've discussed this before. A ticking clock is one way to increase suspense in a story. This isn't a ticking clock per se, because starving to death isn't necessarily a hard boundary, but it's pretty clear to the reader that Juby needs to eat and it needs to happen soon. Time constrains the plot. There's also another category of constraints that isn't always obvious, but one which you absolutely drew upon in order to form your simulation of this story world. Let me ask you, how would you have reacted if I did have Mace come down the tree and sing Bridge Over Troubled Water in the key of G? Wouldn't that have been an amazing story? A chimp with a beautiful silky tenor belting out arguably the most emotional ballad of the 70s. All the other chimps gather around afterwards, group hug. Everyone's feeling congenial. Mace has been softened by Paul Simon's beautiful music. Turns to Juby and he's like, go and get yourself a banana, man. No hard feelings. Amazing, no? Thought not. Stories have rules. We might not think of it in this way, but it's true. Breaking these story rules is offensive in the same way it might be if a baseball player carried his bat with him after the hit and used it to make sure he stretched his single into a double, or if an archer showed up to the range with a rocket launcher. Breaking the rules ruins the game. How do we know what the rules are, though? Well, think about the things you assumed about Juby and his story world. You knew he couldn't solve the problem by flying up to the bananas. Chimps don't have wings, right? You also probably assumed that the laws of physics applied. No doubt you were not expecting Mace to croon out a 70s ballad. These assumptions don't have to be so. We can do anything in fiction, right? Remember Dragonbots? And it's not much of a leap from Dragonbots to Flying Monkeys. Flying Monkey. Flying Monkeys. Now where have we seen those before? There's really no place like home. So much so that you take it with you wherever you go in a fictional universe. You assume the story you're reading about is like your world. People cognitively map the rules of their known world onto the story world until the text tells them to do otherwise. Usually this happens very early in the story. A wizard appearing in the last two chapters of a hard-boiled L.A. cop drama would break the rules that story had established early on. A reader will assume that a chimp is just a generic chimp until they're cued to do otherwise. So if your character is a genetically modified cyborg chimp, better mention it from the outset. We make lots of inferences about a story world that are not directly cued by the text. Behavior, motivations, rules, potential outcomes, it's all very cognitively complex. But what this framework will help us do is begin to identify glaring problems in a story, the big stuff, a plot with too few constraints, will seem like the character succeeded too easily. A plot with too many constraints and a sudden success, deus ex monkey machina. An introduced plot element with few constraints and no resolution? That's a loose end. A resolution without an introduced plot element or constraints? That's just an action. We can sense these things when they're missing, 
Now we can talk about them precisely. That's a step better from a craft standpoint. I've gone on almost long enough, but not quite. There's one final problem writers have to wrestle with that I haven't fully addressed. It's this. How do I know if a plot is moving along at the right pace? The analogy I used in the last lesson is that with suspense, you should always have a little glue on every page. Well, maybe, generally, yes, that's a good idea. But you have to gauge how much you're willing to test your reader's patience if you want to include four pages of poetic description. It's necessarily a judgment call, and it's necessarily a crapshoot to some degree. You might recall that early in the last lesson, I mentioned that our target, our real target, is the brain of another human. And I did say that they're all pretty much the same. That is also not strictly true in every sense, and you know this. Some people are more patient than others. Some really like reading about action. Some love poetic description. Many like adventures. You get the idea. This is where the art of the process comes into play. And one of the major parts of this art form is anticipating how much your text, the literal words on the page, is asking of your reader. How far apart should your plot constraints be? Probably not 30 pages. Beyond that, it's all about figuring out what type of story you're trying to tell and to whom. Mary Laura Ryan, the narratologist who outlined quite a few pieces of the theory on plot presented here, described a great analogy between the suspense in stories and the suspense in sports. At the beginning, all possible avenues for action are open and the suspense is low. You don't know what's going to happen in the game or the story, but you know something is. As the game or the story progresses, constraints, rules, actions, moves, and time close off possible outcomes, squeezing the game or the story to a smaller number of possible outcomes. Eventually, when enough possibilities have been constrained, the stakes are at their highest and so is the suspense. There's a moment where success or failure is decided, banana or no banana, and the plot is resolved. It's a useful model to consider and a good summation. Introduce movement in the story world and a magnetic suspenseful element to catch your reader's attention. Then, strategically introduce constraints of that plot element over the course of the plot, narrowing the possible outcomes to a small window, the process that holds interest through the plot. Lastly, produce a resolution that reveals the answer to the questions posed by the initial plot element. Keep the game moving, and above all, know what kind of game you're trying to play. Work hard and do those things, and eventually, you'll get your banana. If you're anything like me, and I suspect you might be, you're probably thinking something like, that's great and all, Ro, but that seems like an exceedingly simple model to account for the infinite complexity of plot across the entire body of human literature. You're only talking about one silly little banana story. You're right, again, of course, and wrong. If we're being precise, and you know we are, there's a missing piece. You probably already have a sense for what it is. And maybe you've already figured out how to get around that, but we're going to be thorough and make sure you're not missing any pieces. This is your writer's toolbox we're talking about here. Ro's not going to mess around. I've told you over and over again how geeky and pedantic and tedious narrative theorists can be, and I've certainly given you plenty of examples of how I am, my god. But there's one example that always gets me. If you go looking for a book on plot, like I've done many times, shocker, it will take exactly one second for you to spot at least three books telling you exactly how many plots there are. The 13 plots and their deeper significance. 46 essential plots and how to use them. The six universal plots and exploration of story across cultures. Okay, I'm being a little bit tongue-in-cheek, or perhaps cheeky, but there's some truth in it. For some reason, theorists love counting plots. It's just their way of trying to categorize and draw useful inferences, which, as we've seen, can tell us a lot about how stories work. 
But the answer to the how many plots question is blatantly obvious. There are infinite plots. Fiction is a combinatorial system. One look at a thousand and one Arabian Nights makes this clear. There's also another answer to that question that narrative theorists not only aren't going to like, but they're going to hate it so much, Roe might just become the scholar who shall not be named. Which is cool by Roe. There is one plot. There, I said it. Have at me, angry narrative geeks. One plot. What is that plot, Roe, you may ask? Or, you may not have to ask at all. You already know it. I showed you in the last lesson. It's suspense cue plus constraints plus resolution. Remember? That's it. Really. Seriously. It's that simple. Well, it's a little more complex, but not much. I used the term combinatorial earlier to describe fiction. If you've studied linguistics or math, you know what I mean. For those of you who haven't, here's what I'm talking about. Sentences have rules. You know them implicitly if you don't already know them explicitly. If you want to improve your standing in that matter, you should learn them explicitly. If you haven't already, you will when we start to talk about text. There are a finite number of moves that I can make to elongate a sentence beyond a subject and predicate, and it's not that many. You could add a comma and a coordinating conjunction, and if you don't know what I mean by this, I'm giving you a great example of this right now. Or you could add a colon or a semicolon and add another coordinate clause. A coordinate clause is one that doesn't depend on another clause. In other words, it could stand on its own. Or, if you're familiar with how to use loose modifiers, you could add another level of fluidity to your sentences, building longer and longer expressions of complexity, happily adding descriptive information to your base clause, your self-esteem rising with each majestic loose modifier you add, cementing your place amongst the literary elite, or pompous more likely. A few simple rules of syntax at the sentence level quickly yield infinite complexity, a combinatorial system. Plot is the same. It's simpler, though. You already know the three parts. How does that one plot yield all the plots then, Ro? Once you realize this is what's happening, it's not too difficult to see. You might not be able to unsee it. Let's just imagine my chimp story were the opening to a novel about Juby and Sisko. That first complete plot might serve as a nice hook to bring the reader into the story, and if I added a cue or two to signal an attraction between Juby and Sisko, suddenly I've got a suspense cue that wasn't quite tied off in that opening plot. This is one common way that plots get put together. One stretches into the next, a lot like the loose modifiers in my long sentence above. A chain of connecting plots adding up to a much longer story. Many of the series that you see on TV are put together precisely this way, a self-contained episode with suspense cues that refer to a longer story that helps build continuity between mostly self-contained installments. If you weren't aware that was the purpose of those loose threads you absolutely must find out about when the credits roll, I'm sure you were, though. But it should be apparent now. This is one of the oldest storytelling tricks of the trade, a technique employed by Scheherazade in 1001 Arabian Nights, in which the princess delays her execution each morning by enchanting the sultan with a captivating story she cleverly refuses to complete until the following night, when she begins anew by picking up the loose end. These stories are complete plots, linked together by loose ends. Another common method of constructing larger plots is to embed smaller plots within a larger, longer narrative. You're well familiar with this, too. One of the most storied narratives of this type is Homer's Odyssey, which, in the opening few lines, cues the audience to Odysseus's goal, to get home to his wife. All the subsequent adventures on his quest, many of which are their own self-contained subplots, serve as constraints to his larger goal, returning home to Penelope before she remarries. During his misadventure with the Cyclops, for instance, the reader is perfectly capable of processing the events as both a present danger, the subplot, and as a constraint of the larger plot, returning home to his wife and estate. These are often referred to as global, the big plot, and local, the subplot. Very often, large-scale epic narratives will weave multiple self-contained plots together into a massive, sweeping tapestry. An excellent example of this type of narrative is Game of Thrones, an epic filled with magnetic plot elements of all stripes, 
An advantage of having so many parallel plots existent concurrently is that it allows the author to build suspense to different levels and multiple threads. The narrative can build suspense and then leave a thread when the suspense level is high, pausing that thread of the narrative in order to develop another plot thread from inception to climax, then returning to an already developed plot. This way, the level of suspense almost never drops down to zero. An added bonus of such a vast story world is the satisfaction a reader gets from seeing characters from seemingly separate storylines cross paths with other well-known characters from others. A third effect still is that single moves may constrain or resolve multiple subplots simultaneously, yielding higher levels of suspense than a typical constraint or resolution would. When more's at stake, the suspense is higher. Game of Thrones is a marvelous example of combinatorial complexity weaved together underneath the umbrella of a single, massing, overlapping plot of mystery and power. Who will ultimately sit on the throne? For most writers, I suspect this will prove a useful framework for thinking about both local, simpler subplots, and global, larger, or complex plots, and especially how both fit together. It is an admittedly simple way to look at the content of stories. This is the nature of a combinatorial system, a basic underlying algorithm yielding infinite and beautiful complexity. I suspect some readers, especially the narrative geeks of the world, will look to pull at the seams and find narratives that work and don't follow this pattern. I welcome their input on finding a more useful approach. I've yet to see it. I would also mention that not every sentence is perfectly grammatical, yet still follows the underlying pattern, conveying its meaning, albeit imperfectly. Exceptions no doubt exist, as with any rule or system. A tool in the hand that works 99% of the time is far more useful than the empty hand most narrative theorists propose. I also anticipate pushback from literary circles who may find this approach too structured and formulaic. To them I ask, are you bothered by the rules of the sentence? Is that too constrictive a system for you? Does that not constrain your creativity? Doesn't seem to bother poets any. Nor should elucidating the structure of plot bother you. Rather, it offers a useful framework to build ever more elegant complexity with your eyes open to a framework that may once have only been largely obscure. That's my hope. One thing you might begin to notice when applying this framework, especially if you read in multiple genres, is how different types of stories tend to offer different ways of managing plots. The high-paced plots of suspense novels tend to produce multiple subplots filled with moves and mini-climaxes over the course of a larger global plot. I liken this to a juggler with four balls, tossing one ball far into the air while juggling the other three. The move at the beginning tossing the fourth ball so conspicuously high, builds suspense for the moment of that ball's re-entry into the cycle, the climax of the global plot. Meanwhile, the juggler handles the balls in hand, the local plots. Another common technique is to finish a chapter with a cue to mystery, leaving the reader compelled to answer the pressing question, propelling the reader further into the narrative faster. Literary fiction, on the other hand, may present only one main plot, slowly developing over the course of a novel, with constraints being few and sometimes not obvious. The target audience here, no doubt, brings a higher level of patience for a slow-burning story and a reader who takes pleasure in the art of the word and a deeper connection to complex characters. A proper job of dissecting a plot, though, without fail in my experience, will yield a fully realized plot with an introduced plot element, constraints on it, and a resolution of sorts, whether actual or implied. Anything less will yield a plot that seems as confusing to the reader as an ungrammatical sentence would. Like all the lessons here, I offer this as a tool. A writer can use this particular tool as a framework around which to build a kernel of a story that may not yet be complete in their mind. Perhaps it needs more constraints for the resolution to seem satisfying. Or perhaps you've written your story and your reviewers are confused by an element because you've inadvertently sent cues for a plot element you didn't intend to develop and therefore never resolved. This is also an incredibly useful tool for learning about other successful narratives similar to the style of stories you're aiming to write. Have at it. I strongly suggest you dissect your favorite stories to see if you can figure out what you love about them. In my case, it hasn't taken any of the magic out of them.
if anything, the intricacy I've discovered within the most well-formed plots has left me with far more admiration for the genius of the authors than I ever would have had if I'd remained blind to their plot's inner workings. Thus far, we've discussed plot, mostly to the exclusion of character. Next, we'll cover two types of plots that depend on the motivations of characters, dilemma, and conflict. We'll build a useful framework for thinking about how characters interact with each other and their inner selves. There's a video I like to show when I teach this lesson to students. It gets their attention and is a humorous way of getting to an obvious but important point regarding fiction and the lesson at hand. The scene looks like this. A man is standing on a 20-foot ladder about 10 feet off the ground. He's holding a chainsaw. The ladder is leaning against a tree. The man, almost unbelievably, proceeds to saw down the tree on which his ladder is propped. I suspect I enjoy playing this video more than my students enjoy watching it, because I get to see their reactions, which are instantaneous and vary from hands on heads to raised eyebrows to, oh my god, how could anybody possibly be that dumb, to a subtle devilish grin from the odd rascal in the group. The video is about a minute long, and the rising level of suspense as this guy whomps away at the tree with his chainsaw is amazing until, inevitably, the trunk begins to list, the ladder begins to fall, and man and chainsaw go tumbling into a heap as the trunk comes crashing to the ground. The man gets up unharmed after a few seconds, in case you are concerned. A bump to his pride and a video memorialization of his not-so-finest hour are the only real wounds. The point is this, from the second everyone in my class sees that scenario, they know what's going to happen. Predictive inference is at the heart of our ability to process fiction. People can visualize the outcome of a scenario like this, and we're so good at making inferences that by the second people see the setup of that clip, they know the outcome. It's a rare cognitive feat in the animal kingdom, though. Chimps and dolphins do it to a much smaller degree, and perhaps octopi and cuttlefish, but few others. Humans see the possible future with that falling ladder so clearly that it creates a visceral emotional response, that anticipatory cringe we all know so well. Today we're not talking falling ladders, but we are talking possible futures, modal universes in geek speak. They're what we're constructing as we process a story. Most of the time they're not as clear as man on ladder takes chainsaw to tree, but this concrete illustration is a good place to start. A modal universe is what allows us to plan for the future, chart a course, and realize a possible outcome. As avatars of human agents and story worlds, our characters are going to need to do this too, and as writers, if we get this right, it's an excellent way to create magnetic suspense throughout the course of our stories. This is at the heart of what makes our representations of people in the story world seem real to our readers. So how do we do this? Possible worlds theory goes back several decades in both cognitive science and narrative theory, and it has implications for characters in this case that would go something like this. A character, like a person, has multiple facets to their personality. Some will be consonant, some will conflict. Inevitably, some facet of their personality will desire to change the state of their story world to a more desired state. Hungry Juby wants to become banana-eating Juby, and in the fastest possible way, for example. This simple framework for thinking about character knowledge and motivation is at the heart of possible worlds theory, and it's a useful way to approach two of the most magnetic plot elements, dilemma and conflict. Knowledge worlds. To start, in order for a character to have a desire to change their world, they have to have ideas about their world. Every character, just like every person, has their own unique set of knowledge about the world they inhabit. They have beliefs, assumptions, theories, and hard knowledge about their surroundings, 
A detective in a mystery story, for example, probably has a lot of useful knowledge about how to solve a murder based on experience. What that detective needs to lack for the story to have any suspense is the identity of the murderer. These two things, what a character knows and what they don't know, delineate the border of their knowledge world. This is the baseline, the status quo. The knowledge world of a character matters because this is the framework they use to act in their world. To use the example of Juby again, there are several important pieces of knowledge the reader must have in order to understand Juby's actions as a character. Primary among these is that he's hungry and injured. He also believes that the two larger male chimps don't like him and will hurt him if he tries to get food. He's unsure about the others. He doesn't know any other source of food that's readily available. He seems to think that his best chance for survival is to stay with this group and to see how it plays out. That's what he knows according to the textual account that is presented to the reader. This is a character's knowledge world. Wish worlds. The future a character desires to bring about is called a wish world. This is Juby stuffed with bananas and injury-free, probably getting on fairly well as a fully accepted member of the group. Characters' wish worlds can also be thought of as goals, and these need to be either implicit in the text or stated clearly for the reader to understand what the character's goal is. One of the commonest refrains in fiction workshops is the statement, I don't know what this character wants. If you've heard that before or uttered it, it's because a character's wish world wasn't properly conveyed by the textual cues. The wish world is what keys readers into a character's motivation for acting. This is generally easy in stories that revolve around danger or wealth, because it's safe to assume the character doesn't want to be hurt and would love to be famously wealthy. Who wouldn't? In a story about adultery, perhaps, the motivation for straying won't be implicitly obvious, and the reader may need some textual cues in order to begin to understand the character's behavior. Obligation Worlds As avatars of people, characters inherit our baggage. If a character is a rocket scientist, that character is going to know a lot of cool things about rockets and probably make a nice living for it. But when 7 o'clock rolls around, that character is going to have to roll out of bed and go to work, just like the rest of us. Characters have obligations, too. The character's obligation world represents the set of obligation that goes along with the life the author envisions for that character. If he's a father, he must take care of his children. If she's a judge, she must file paperwork and show up for work on time. These obligations involve things like following the implicit rules of the culture as well. Not shouting at random strangers at a bus stop, for example, or not throwing snowballs at cops, things like that. Plots start to get interesting when different parts of characters' worlds come into conflict. Good stories start here. A small tension between an obligation and a wish world might be, company policy is that Audrey is supposed to be at her desk from 9 to 12 every weekday, but a friend she hasn't seen since college has invited her to coffee at 10.30 on Tuesday. Does Audrey duck out for a few minutes? A big tension might be, Thomas is married and has a new colleague at the office who has been paying obvious attention to him. Thomas finds this new colleague very attractive. They go for drinks after work and flirt. There's a hotel across the street from the bar. That sort of thing. Bringing characters' conflicting inner worlds into opposition is the root of suspense in dilemma and conflict narratives. Theoretically, a character could have any number of infinite worlds that come into conflict. Fantasy worlds and pretend worlds are two examples. But the primary suspense and dilemmas and conflicts almost always comes from clashes of wish worlds and obligation worlds. Dilemmas A good dilemma usually stems from a conflict between a wish and an obligation, though sometimes a clash between two wishes or two obligations can be just as powerful. The key to crafting a good dilemma is a fair balance between two options that necessarily oppose one another. The more a character has to gain or lose, the higher the suspense will be. Here's an example. Andre is a starting linebacker at a prominent college football program that just won their conference championship. The day after their bowl game, he sees a banned supplement in the backup nose tackle's gym bag. The nose tackle, Scott, only played a handful of snaps in the championship game and none of them made a noticeable impact on the outcome, which the team won by a fair margin. Andre knows that reporting his teammate 
may result in the forfeiture of the conference championship, resulting in a substantial loss of money and prestige to the program. He believes this will alienate him from his teammates and result in blowback from the entire coaching staff. Andre is deeply Christian, though, and believes that remaining silent about Scott's cheating would constitute a significant sin. There's a lot to lose here, including his starting position the following year, and maybe even an opportunity to play at the professional level. Who knows how scouts will view a whistleblower? Probably not well. Not to mention that his teammates are his only social support system at the university. How does Andre negotiate this minefield, playing out this tension between two possible worlds inside the psyche of a single character? is what makes a dilemma narrative so magnetically compelling. The reader gets a free pass at a highly complex social scenario with no obvious right or wrong answer, and potentially tremendous repercussions on either end. You may think you know how Andre should act, but so much of what is difficult with dilemmas can be unforeseen. The reader gets to play out the scenario by walking in Andre's shoes. A free pass at hashing out a narrative dilemma without consequences is a compelling narrative game that readers generally jump at the opportunity to play if it's well-crafted and the stakes are high for the character. How Andre acts will ultimately shape how a reader feels about this character. Is he a forthright hero, a snitch, or a do-gooder out to draw attention to himself? Is he all three? Conflict. Whether between individuals, groups, or nations, conflict follows a similar model. The conflicting motivation of opposing wish worlds clash. Only, instead of the psyche of a single character, two or more characters play at this game. The added dimension here is that the characters can take action to influence the behavior of the other parties. Andre, for instance, learns that Zack, one of the team captains, knows about Scott, too. Zack has a sense that Andre's going to blow the whistle, and he's not happy about the prospects of having his conference title stripped. That title is what Zack has worked toward his entire life. Over a backup nose tackle? Andre gets back to his off-campus apartment one night to find his tire slashed and a single word scrawled in chalk on his windshield. Don't. Now we've got a conflict. These two guys want totally different things, and only one of them will get to see their wish fulfilled. The suspense in the plot comes from watching these two parties work to bring their opposing future wish worlds into being. Dilemmas and conflicts are two prominent ways that character and plot are hopelessly intertwined. The situations and stories that I've generated here are designed to be simple, to illustrate the points being covered in the clearest possible manner. Even so, complexity arises. Some of the most compelling and famous literary stories aren't drawn much more subtly than my example here. Other inter-character conflicts are remarkably subtle, as though sometimes the characters themselves may not clearly understand why they're acting the way they are. Thinking about your character's inner worlds, especially in a narrative whose plot is centered around dilemma or conflict, will give you a framework for drawing your reader into their suspenseful struggle. These two magnetic elements represent the ultimate in the psychological unknown, mediating the gray area between right and wrong and all the consequences that go with that, and that will make for one hell of a story. Addendum. It's worth saying a few words here on epiphanies. Though not quite as in vogue these days as they once were, literary epiphanies were all but a requirement for characters in literary stories during the early to mid-20th century. What constitutes an epiphany hasn't ever been all that well defined, although one decent definition from a prominent craft guide goes as follows. A character is brought or forced into a state of enlightenment, experiencing a moment when he or she realizes something of great importance to his or her life. I've found it useful to think of epiphanies as an action or happening in the story world that shifts the fundamental layers of a character's knowledge world. They learn something of which they were totally unaware that shifts their self-identity or their major framework for viewing the world. I mention it here because the knowledge world is a good way to approach this concept. <laughs>
Our starting point on plot, if you can remember back that far, was the idea that action verbs created a temporal sequence in the story world, move time forward in the reader's simulation. So we were always going to end up here, dealing with time. In the next two lessons, we'll take a close look at two of the ways fiction writers have to wrestle with the portrayal of time in their story worlds. This lesson is about the more conspicuous of these two considerations, the order of the events unfolding in the story. Not surprisingly, most stories run in one direction with regard to time. After all, it's how we experience the world, past, present, future. And, as we'll see, it's usually easier for both author and reader to manage a story that unfolds along a far more familiar, linear timeline. Sometimes, though, for narrative effect, storytellers will deviate from a traditional linear path. One familiar example of this is a climactic hook, when a storyteller begins at the climax, presenting a reader a sneak peek at the maximum suspense level awaiting them, a good bet to pique a reader's interest. Then, the narrator dials the story back to the beginning, showing their audience how it all got started and the eventual stakes. You know where the story's going, and you're willing to wait to get there. But things are now all out of order, and we'll need to talk about it. Let's get started. The breaking of linear timelines is one of the oldest distinctions in modern narrative theory, first expounded upon by the Russian formalists of the late 19th century. You don't need to know about them. I only mention them because, unfortunately, they left us the terminology nerdy literary folks use to talk about this aspect of stories. Fabula and sujet. We're not going to use them. Let's do this instead. Suppose I were to tell a story of the real world, at least as it pertains to humans. Let's say for the sake of this illustration that our world is a fictional story world. Tell me at times it doesn't seem like it is. Let's follow this story world's timeline, from the moment people tell their first stories at campfires and start building tools and pooling their resources and tribes. Now walk the timeline forward as civilization begins to develop in Mesopotamia, Jericho, and Egypt, and spreads out to Europe and Asia. We end up in the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, all the way forward to our time. Let's call this the True Timeline. It's the story of all things unfolding in their actual sequence in the story world, one minute to the next, following the natural progression of space-time. Now let's presume I'm a novelist. Good presumption, by the way. I get the crazy idea that the Greek gods were actual living beings, immortal space travelers with superpowers who took human form and lived amongst us, eating our bread and drinking our wine. Nowadays, these immortals have become powerful bankers, running the Fed and the European Bank, something like that. They're feuding behind the scenes. It's the reason for all our economic strife, you see. As the storyteller, I decide that the best way to tell this story is to show how their current feud began all the way back in Greece. I give you a scene with the major players scowling at each other as Athens burns in the background. Hades vows revenge. Then I fast forward to modern times, presenting my reader with the current lay of the land, how Zeus is the head of the IMF, Hades is pulling strings now at the EU, and Poseidon is the real brains behind China's financial rise to prominence over the last two decades. Whatever. The key to how the whole thing plays out, mind you, are the other gods. Hera, Athena, Demeter, Dionysus, and you, dear reader, need to know how each one got allied with their current faction. For that, I'm going to need to give you a scene back in ancient Egypt where Dionysus comes rolling up the Nile on a riverboat, packed to the gills with wine barrels, and parties all night long with Poseidon. Then I'm going to jump off to India, where Zeus and Hera are introduced by Vishnu at an ashram, and incestuous sparks immediately fly when they stumble upon a spare copy of the Kama Sutra. I continue to bounce around like this until the stage is set for our modern-day showdown. Then, it's on. I've just shuffled the cards of time, so to speak, in order to offer you a complete, albeit complex and ridiculous, story. The best terminology I can come up with to describe this is a story sequence. It's the order of scenes as presented by the narrator once the cards have been shuffled. Maybe the true timeline would tell a more complete story but it would be a different story, and it would take forever and totally drag in the first hundred pages while you were learning all about who was friends with whom and why. As a narrator, I decide that the suspense will be better sustained by interspersing those alliance-building scenes in the past with scenes that ramp up the tension in the present-day showdown. By the time the audience has met all the allies in the past, 
the climax of the present day showdown is already set up. We rejoin the true timeline for the climactic battle of the immortal space traveling bankers. Yes! Are you as excited for it as I am? I mean, I could toss in a few dragon bots to spice things up. This thing needs a little spicing up, I'd say. But it illustrates the point. Sometimes the best way to maintain suspense over the course of a messy narrative, or to introduce a character who comes into the story part way, is to use a story sequence that doesn't follow the true timeline. For a minor character's backstory, or a piece of history that just doesn't fit with a linear telling, sometimes a story sequence is the way to go. We'll look at a few types of stories where this works quite well, far more elegantly than my Greek god bankers, no doubt. In order to do this, you're going to need to jump around in time, obviously, and we're going to talk about this. It's worth having our terminology straight. Fortunately, there's good terminology in common parlance, flashback and flash forward. Let's use them. The final important piece of terminology represents the time skipped. In literary circles, you may hear the term ellipsis, but I'd love to keep it simpler than that. Let's call it a gap. Flashbacks, flash forwards, and gaps. Beautiful. Okay, I've talked about a couple reasons a writer might do these things, to sustain suspense and tell backstory over a sweeping narrative with tons of players. What are some other reasons for shuffling the deck? Theme. I can think of a pair of films that deal with a thematic connection between multiple protagonists that shuffle the deck to show similarities between the characters. Julie and Julia and The Godfather Part Two. Certainly the better known of these two films is the second installment of The Godfather Saga. For our purposes, looking at films is actually faster, more self-evident, and more helpful. In any case, the film starring Robert De Niro and Al Pacino follows the lives of both Corleone godfathers, Michael, during the present day of the story world, and Vito, through flashbacks in the past. The thematic parallel tells the story of Vito growing up and rising to prominence in the New York underworld, while Michael's story, which begins with him already in charge of the family Vito had built, focuses on Michael solidifying his power, expanding to a new area and turning his local crime family into a national empire. The viewer gets to follow the two men's similar paths to prominence, from poverty through danger, transgression, and violence, ultimately to power and wealth. Highly magnetic. Sure beats Rose's latest brainchild, Olympian Bankers vs. Dragon Bots. The other film I mentioned, Julie and Julia, focuses on the lives of two characters, a modern-day New Yorker who writes a popular blog about cooking every recipe in Julia Child's cookbook, and Julia Child herself, as she's learning to cook in France. The film is actually based on two books that were published around the same time. The filmmakers chose to jump between the present and the past in order to closely show parallels between the two women and to make one coherent story. No doubt it would have been strange and poorly received to make a movie in which the first half follows the life of Julia Child exclusively, only to completely abandon the legendary Ms. Child to take up the story of a little-known modern-day blogger for the second half. Together, though, these two parts make a coherent, thematic whole. Not quite the cinematic masterpiece like the Godfather sequel, but still a well-received film that effectively bounces between timelines to excellent thematic effect. Surely there are other examples that will come to your mind. The Hours by Michael Cunningham just popped into mine. And that's great if you're starting to think this way. You're getting it. Breaking up timelines is a great way to show parallel themes in separate individual lives or time periods. Object or place. Another example of a successful use of a nonlinear story sequence is The Red Violin, a story that is anchored around a fictional violin from the 1600s. The present-day storyline in the story world takes place in 1997 Montreal, where the famous Red Violin has come up for auction. The film bounces back to the violin's creation, following the object as it passes hands from prodigies to gypsies to musicians rescuing instruments amid China's cultural revolution. Each one of the segments serves to heighten the viewer's connection to the object, its tumultuous history and survival through the ages, raises the level of suspense when the film's climax, the present-day auction, finally occurs. Similarly, one could anchor a story around a place with a deep history, like an old village in Europe, a temple in India, or a neighborhood in Boston. 
While the plot of each segment is likely to be mostly self-contained, the connection to the object or place affords the writer the opportunity to tie these plot units together into a larger coherent work with a central focus. Hidden Past Another film that comes to mind is Clint Eastwood's The Bridges of Madison County, an adaptation of a Robert James Waller novella. There are two timelines, a present day, where the adult children of a farming family return to their homestead in Iowa to bury their recently deceased mother. The film then flashes back to the main plot of the story, a secret affair their mother had with a photographer when they were children. In the present, the disbelieving son and daughter go through the letters exchanged between their mother and her secret lover in order to piece together the history of this hidden chapter of their mother's past. It ends up deeply affecting them in their present-day lives. A hidden past narrative like this one can often be used to dramatize the contrast between the way we think about the world as we believe it to be versus the way it really is. Likewise, a single scene of a hidden past can be used to reveal information that has been concealed from the reader or audience for dramatic effect, a twist at the ending that brings a revelation into focus. A helpful hint that I can offer as an author of at least three novels that unfold across multiple timelines and locations, if you're going to write a story with multiple timelines, outline those timelines meticulously, especially if they intersect. This is a place where the Kim approach can get you into serious trouble. In order to make a coherent story blending multiple overlapping plots, the timelines must fit together. You need to consider a time difference when a character in Chicago calls a character in Sydney. And if your characters are going to go somewhere, you need to know how long it would take them to get there on a plane. I've spent hours standing over a 10-foot strip of paper with a line on it and a deck of index cards in hand struggling to fit multiple timelines together. When actions over multiple intersecting timelines begin to affect one another, things get complex very fast. In cases like this, Plotting is the only way to go, and index cards are your friend. This is another one of those places where the complexity can be theoretically infinite. Mixing timelines can be a tricky business. Choosing what information to reveal to your reader at which point in the story will inevitably shape their impression of your simulation in a massive way. You may have a wonderful complete picture of your story world across multiple time periods and places, the trick is getting that picture from your head into theirs using the tools you have. And that tool only operates one way, one word at a time, left to right, across the page, top to bottom. That's part of the challenge. It's good to have a handle on why you're shuffling the deck in the first place. It should be to a purpose. And if you find yourself struggling to pull the story together, Always consider the larger picture, the overarching plot, the global, introduced plot element, plus constraints, plus resolution. It's the proper framework to ground all your subplots against. Once upon a time, Rowe sat down to compose a skills-based guide to writing fiction, working day and night for many months before finally it was complete. A masterful work of form, function, and style. Brilliant. After numerous consultations with fellow writers, reviewers, mentors, and sending a slew of book proposals to major publishers, Rowe was certain the mechanics of fiction writing was on the path to literary glory. Rowe waited. Four years later, after exhausting every lead and having every figurative door slammed in the literal author's figurative face, the book still goes sadly unnoticed by a cruel world ignorant of the utility and excellence of the work that lies therein. For shame. Of course not. You're here, and thank you for that. Remember, I am a fiction writer, after all. But you see what I did there? I took you on a journey through time in a fictional story world. One where the mechanics of fiction writing is not already a tremendous success. Can you believe it? <laughs>
The two paragraphs that open this lesson span an uncertain period of time that includes the entire composition of these lessons, the editing process, and a clearly delineated gap of four years subsequent to them. That's an awful long time for so few words, but language can do this. It poses both a challenge and a tremendous opportunity to be flexible about how we portray time in our story worlds. Today, we're talking about the other dimension of time a writer must wrestle with, how long to dwell in a moment, how many words to a second, minute, hour, or eon. This is duration, friends. How long should we stay? Also, once upon a time, in writer's circles, there was an edict that was mindlessly repeated as though it were federal law, show, don't tell. You've probably heard this before, and if you're the slightest bit literal-minded, your response was probably something like, isn't it all telling? Yes, it is. I mean, inasmuch as one written word at a time is a closer metaphor for telling than showing, but I digress. The show don't tell edict is still a bit of an axiom you'll hear these days, but not spoken quite as forcefully or as often, and usually with a far better understanding of the utility of telling. These are all just metaphorical terms, though, and aren't as precise as I'd like to be, so let's get precise as to what we're really talking about, a crucial point that fiction writers quite often miss. What does it mean to show and not tell? The other way this is often expressed, somewhat confusingly, is scene versus summary. What constitutes a scene and what constitutes a summary? Exactly. That's the piece that rarely gets talked about. And it's so important to get this right. You probably have a fuzzy idea of a scene being visual and fast-flowing, and perhaps a summary as possessing a vague collection of images bound together over an unfixed period of time. Reading scenes and summaries is something like that. But the key piece of information is this. A text has no temporality of its own. It is an object. Yes, a book is just a string of symbols that represent words that represent ideas. If no one picks up the book to simulate the information stored in those words, it's just an atemporal string of characters. So what's the significance of this? A writer needs to consider two timelines. There's the imaginary time that theoretically passes in the story world, that is, the way the story ideally unfolds as designed by the author. And then there's the actual time that passes for the reader as they read the text, that is, how long does it take your reader to read the words in each passage? The tension between these two times is the primary distinction that separates showing from telling, scene from summary. It may seem a little confusing right now, but we'll get it nailed down, promise. You may recall that I began these lessons on plot by speaking about time in another context, action verbs versus linking verbs. I mentioned that action verbs were the story's play button. It's a good metaphor, but it misses something important. If you press play on a video online, it progresses at one speed, the speed of life, we'll call it. Sure, you could go to the settings and slow down the video or speed it up if you like, but let's just think of normal speed for right now, the speed of life. Our play button as writers isn't a hard play button like this. It depends on readers and the time it takes them to read the words on the page. It's a bit of a fuzzy play button. What makes a scene then? When the passage of time being portrayed in the story world roughly matches the time it takes the average reader to read it, that's what makes a scene. That's it, Ro? Yes, friends, that's the big one. We'll talk about the vividness of detail and providing objects and actions that beg to be visualized, a bit here but especially when we talk about space. The most important distinction here is with time, though. If you want to put a scene in your book, it needs to take approximately the same amount of time to read as it would for the unfolding action to happen in the story world. Got it? Good. Our fuzzy play button could do a bunch of other things, too. For starters, I skipped us four years into the future in my opening. A gap. We can do that, too. Think of this fuzzy play button as one of your tools. We're going to look at some different ways to use it effectively. I've designed a handy little spectrum so you can see your full range of options, and we'll discuss some key points of each. Scene. 
We know a little about these already, but scene writing can be so important that a few more things definitely bear mentioning. Here, we're aiming at a synchronization between the time of the reader's reading and the time theoretically passing in the story world. There are a few helpful tools for this. The first is dialogue. Check this out. Rose sat down at the desk, concentrating, getting all telepathic. I'm talking about scenes, Rose said. Scenes? the reader answered across the Great Divide. What about them? Well, they're really important. If you get the timing wrong, your reader's going to have a hard time simulating your scene. I get that, Ro. You've been saying that all day. Okay, but the dialogue. Yeah, okay, Ro. I get that now, too. Reading dialogue takes approximately the same amount of time as it would for the character to say it. That's my point, though. It's very immersive. Yeah, you're right, the reader said. But you were saying something earlier about action verbs? You want to know about those, too? Ro said. Yes, please, we get the point with the dialogue already. Sure. In addition to dialogue, quick declarative sentences that convey action are a good way to match up these two times as well. Did you notice that I started my dialogue above with a quick declarative sentence? Rose sat down at the desk. That's what I'm talking about here. Actions are not only great fodder for a reader to simulate, Frankie swung his foot at the bouncing ball, missed, and went spinning onto his back. The angry bull leapt over the fence. Rachel's car went flying down the hill toward Sensabaw Avenue. But they also match up quite well with an average reader's reading time. When you're writing a scene, it's worth considering how much description you're using to direct the reader's simulation. There's usually no need to over-direct. Remember that a reader is a lot like you, and that the telepathy game is cooperative. Just like you do when you read, your reader will fill in some gaps in description here. A good example of this might be the sentence about the bull jumping over the fence. I don't have to mention that there's ground on the other side of the fence for a reader to visualize it, right? They'll just put the ground in their simulation. They might even put in a thump when the bull lands on the other side of the fence for good measure. And readers probably assume the fence isn't a police barricade in Times Square, right? so there's no need to bog down an otherwise smoothly flowing scene with too many needless details. If an important object is introduced in a scene, try to be quick about it, or mindful that you're pushing the pause button. No need to know that the fence is made of one and a half inch round, hollow steel alloy runners joined at the post with galvanized titanium U-joints. Sure, you can visualize that, but if you push it and don't get back to the action, your scene is going to stall. Bull, fence, got it, good. The writer-reader relationship is one of trust. Scenes are a great place to trust your readers. But you may want to slow down a scene for effect. That's a whole other technique. Stretch. We should go back to the metaphor of the video player for this concept. Stretching a scene is like playing a scene in slow motion. You might choose to use this technique for dramatic effect at a critical moment in a story. Check this out. The following passage is from the story Labor Day Dinner by Canadian short story maestra Alice Munro. At this precise moment in the story, a family is on their way home following a dinner marked by the kind of squabbling that often happens when an extended family gets together. Those arguments probably seem meaningful at the time. Then this happens. Along the second crossroad, from the west, a dark green 1969 Dodge is traveling at between 80 and 90 miles an hour. Two young men are returning from a party to their home in Logan. One has passed out. The other is driving. He hasn't remembered to put the lights on. He sees the road by the light of the moon. There isn't time to say a word. Roberta doesn't scream. George doesn't touch the brake. The big car flashes before them. A huge, dark flash without lights, seemingly without sound. It comes out of the dark corn and fills the air right in front of them, the way a big flat fish will glide into view suddenly in an aquarium tank. It seems to be no more than a yard in front of their headlights. Then it's gone. It has disappeared into the corn on the other side of the road. Alice, I am not worthy. In Rose's humble opinion, this is stunning writing absolutely sublime. You've probably already absorbed what I love about this passage, based on the topic and context. 
Alice is managing time here like a virtuoso, moving the story along at a sharp clip to that inevitable moment when the cars seem destined to collide. She's also giving you something very specific to visualize, a dark green 1969 Dodge traveling at between 80 and 90 miles an hour. And then it happens. She cues you to know exactly how long it takes. There isn't time to say a word. Yet the text cues a lot in that briefest of moments, that George doesn't touch the brake, that Roberta doesn't scream. Reading these two sentences has already taken us past real-world time at the speed of life, but our narrator continues anyway. There's a 60-word description of the moment for you to linger on and visualize. The flash of the car, where it came from, that it glides like a big flat fish into view, that it passes no more than a yard in front of them. Then, just as the passage seems to move from stretch to pause, poof, then it's gone. Three words that bring an end to the stretching of time and the suspense is released. And don't you just feel like you've simulated a moment when life slows down and stretches out, a lot like people report when they have a near-death experience? This is a masterful management of duration. A sentence more would have lingered too much. A sentence less, and it's not quite right. Perfect, Alice. Telepathy at its finest. Somebody really should give you an award or something. Pause. One of the things about the show-don't-tell axiom that can be confusing is that often there isn't a hard boundary between when you're in a scene, a stretch, a pause, or a summary. Alice's summary leading up to the near collision is very scene-like, partly because she's brought the reader to that point using language that cues scene, objects to visualize, and progressive action verbs, is traveling, returning, and driving. It cues the reader to put that car in motion. Is it summary or a scene of its own? Tough to tell. It's not quite an exact science here with pause, either. Even a pause can contain many visual cues, especially a description of a space or object. Remember Stephen's rabbit? That rabbit on the table was just begging to be visualized. But it wasn't really moving. We were still essentially dealing with a pause. We'll cover some ways to create excellent vivid cues for visualization when we talk about space. But for now, let's stick with duration. Functionally, a pause can be great for presenting the state of the story world to a reader, especially at the start of a story. If we return to the first paragraph of the Juby Banana story, you'll get a good example of how you can convey a chunk of vital information relatively quickly. You may also want to consider what it feels like for Roe to juxtapose this silly banana story with the climax of a Nobel Prize winner's actual short story. Juby was starving. It had been over four days since he'd eaten a thing, and all the other chimps, who were full, had been harassing him nonstop. He was seated at the base of the banana tree, looking up at the fruit, hanging there as though it were taunting him. Mace and Uggo were the two who had actually hurt his ankle, hobbling him so severely that he couldn't get up on two legs, though Juby knew he could get up the tree if Mace weren't around. Note the linking in atemporal verbs. Was starving, had been, were full, had been, was seated, knew. You're getting the state of things, Juby's state of being. A pause, almost counterintuitively, can draw a reader into the situation fast, before the writer presses play. I've presented a few important things to visualize here, too. A seated chimp beneath a banana tree, and some bananas, and maybe even the other two chimps if the reader wants to place them out of context. So it's not that this paragraph isn't showing to some degree, but it's mostly telling the reader about the state of the story world. You're definitely going to find pauses useful both for setting a scene as I've done here, or for describing place details and objects in your story world. Never be afraid to pause to a purpose, as long as you're mindful of what the passage is cueing for the reader trying to simulate it. Lots of visual cues in a description of setting might offer a pleasant respite from continuing action, especially if they're well-drawn cues. Fourteen pages describing the difference between your character's front and rear suspension and his rally car might just turn your book into a doorstop before the all-important scene, the race. Summary. The easiest way to characterize summary 
is as a section of text that takes less time for a reader to read than it would for the events to unfold in the story world. For reasons mentioned above, there isn't a particularly hard boundary here, especially when summaries offer particularly visual cues within them. To wit, George went into the room cautiously optimistic. Over the course of the ten-minute appointment, the doctor told George that his cancer was progressing. The old oncologist often paused to grimace and shake his head while staring down into the chart, instead of looking George in the eyes. George took this as a bad sign and spent most of the time trying to guess how many cotton balls were in that little jar on the counter, and then how many he could possibly swallow if he had a glass of water to help wash them down. It was not a productive appointment. He left the room dejected, trying to figure out how to break the news to his sons with minimal disruption to their lives. It certainly doesn't take ten minutes to read this passage. So, we're in summary territory. This passage certainly has scene-like elements, though. I've deliberately given you cues to visualize that blur the lines, the doctor's grimacing and head-shaking, the cotton balls on the counter, a glass of water. But in terms of what this story is probably about, the time has been crunched down to convey the important information in the appointment, that the cancer has progressed, and that the doctor didn't convey a posture of optimism. This is the primary purpose of a summary. It usually condenses actions for the sake of brevity and provides necessary information that can't be left to the reader to fill in. What George learned in that appointment is probably going to be vital to the plot of that story, but a ten-minute scene, or even a two-minute scene, may not be justified. The duration of summaries, of course, can vary widely. Veronica was packed in an hour. It took her just over five hours to drive from Providence to Ithaca, but she was flying the entire way, scanning the horizon for cops with a dagger focus and keeping her high beams on the entire time. Here, essentially there are two time periods crunched down into these two sentences for a total of six hours. You can do the same thing with one sentence in an era. The Peloponnesian War plunged the Greek city-states into a state of chaos for nearly 28 years. Lastly, we have gaps. Sometimes gaps will be clear-cut and usually announced by an adverbial phrase that specifies time. The following day, Greg got fired for failing to show for work. But other times, there won't be such a clearly delineated gap in time. Sometimes, for stylistic reasons, a writer might leave the length of a gap a mystery for the reader to solve. One chapter, the character is a clean-cut banker working nine to five. In the next, he's sporting a mountain man beard, shaggy clothes, and walking in the wilderness at an unknown time. A few other tools that create unspecified gaps are ends of chapters, white space, and breaks between sections, book one versus book two. A writer might leave events in these gaps mysterious as well to generate some suspense as the story picks up again. So those are the tools of duration. How will you use them? That, my friend, is entirely up to you. But now that you know roughly how they work, hopefully that question will be a lot easier for you to answer. I'll mention that it's not a terrible idea to look to generate scenes at the important points in the story, to linger here and dramatize the moments that most impact the story you're trying to tell. But this, too, is not an exact science. Take Alice's story Labor Day Dinner, for instance. All the conflict between the characters takes place before the near collision. The story is filled with dialogue that ostensibly should be very immersive, yet the only part of that story I remember is the summary before the near crash and the pause that lingers on the moment. That green dodge is hanging out there in space, illuminated by the family's headlights. The important point is having a finger on that button. Knowing that duration is a key component in how your reader processes the story in their mind. I've found that the best tool for feeling out whether a scene is too long or too short or flowing at the right tempo is to read it. How long did it take you to get through it? Does it feel like the story is progressing at the speed of life? Great. You've got yourself a scene, probably through savvy use of dialogue, sharp, action-packed sentences, and incisive visual cues. If it's too slow, cut a few sentences down and read it again. Repeat until the tempo feels right. Sometimes that's the best we can do. There will still always be an art to this endeavor that separates the Alice's from the rest of us. But now that we know the tools of the trade, we know what you're up to, Alice, and 
we're still mightily impressed. Well, at least Roe is, anyway. And a few random folks in Sweden. Or is it Norway? Maybe one of you folks will find out one day and can tell me for sure. Make sure to drop me a line if you do. So, now would you like to hear Rowe's definition of plot? Thought not. But now you can surely empathize. There's a lot that goes into the stuff that happens in a story. There's the temporal movement that comes with action verbs getting the story moving, the need for suspense to grab interest, the question of what interests, the management of constraints and resolution to sustain suspense, the global and the local, the sequence of actions, and the time it takes the reader to take it all in. Surely this is one of the reasons most writers scratch their heads when asked about plot. One of my hopes is that delineating the specific issues embedded under the term plot will sharpen discussions of how to talk about it, teach it, and write it. The tools here, I hope, will serve both as a way for teachers to approach teaching this material, but also a way for learners to self-teach. Nothing has sharpened my writing more than dissecting a piece of elegant writing with the proper tools in hand. If I like a story for its content, I like to map out plot elements, constraints, and resolutions. If a story manages time masterfully, I look at the temporal cues. How does this writer make a scene a scene or a summary more scene-like, etc.? If you think you don't have access to writing classes, meet your local library card. Read great stories and take them apart. I give you full liberty. Please, pull at those seams. Lastly, there are a few things that I should mention here, as they didn't quite fit within the lessons where I'd originally outlined them. So why not pop in a few codas? Coda 1. When thinking about the grammar of a plot, it's not always, maybe even not commonly self-evident, what the magnetic nature of the plot is until the story is finished. You don't know where the story is going as a reader, remember. You only have the full picture at the end. A suspense cue is usually experienced as a feeling that something should be paid attention to. It pops from the background and begs the reader to file it away in their long-term memory. Subsequent cues to constraints are then processed along the lines of, I wonder if this is related to that thing I filed away in the first paragraph, and, aha, it is, I knew something was up and now things are about to go down. Once the story is over, it pays to go back and see what magnetic roots the author was tickling. Is this a transgression story? And what is it telling us about transgression? Hint, you don't get away with anything. You really do start to see the patterns of what makes great writing great by looking at how great writers deal with plot. They all know what they're doing, at least implicitly. Coda 2 a generally good move in any piece of writing is to bring important things back through the course of the document. When the reader sees something familiar, it offers a sense that the story, article, essay, etc. is being managed well and weaved together by somebody who's going to bring it all back around. If you look closely enough, you'll see this happen in the finest literary stories, though usually subtly. A theme, an object, a happening, even a particular turn of phrase, they recur often like rungs on a ladder, helping the reader understand they're in an ordered progression, meticulously designed to evoke a desired effect. Coda 3. That's it. You now have more explicit functional knowledge about plot than most fiction writers out there. Congratulations. Now, please don't be smug about it. If you're some 20-year-old undergrad in a beginning fiction writing class and the poor graduate student teaching the class doesn't know what you mean by a grammatical plot or duration and hasn't yet figured out that action verbs and linking verbs are the keys to managing movement in a narrative, please, give him a break, will ya? Remember what I said all the way back at the start of this mess? When you knew a lot less about plot explicitly 
that most fiction writers are kims and therefore so are most teachers of the craft you can learn a tremendous amount from a kim i sure as hell did besides rose already given you the david side of things anyway and if you go out to the movies and inevitably the suspense cues and their underlying magnetic nature jump out at you as if they were screaming here over here pay attention to me i'm important danger danger wealth sex 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 don't go spoiling the movie because you're so smart because that's not really smart at all and when your friends are surprised or find something you've seen through as deeply meaningful don't say something smarmy like i don't know i thought it was all very pedestrian and obvious and not that well written at all remember that storytelling is a social experience if you're a writer be glad you've still got any friends to go to the movies with at all. Take joy in their joy and hope that your writing will do that for someone someday too. I'm kidding here, of course, but only halfway. This is kind of the lesson in the karate class where they teach you how to kick ass, but that you never should. You're a lethal weapon now, so swagger, but don't strike. And don't think you're that special. You hardly know anything about the narrator yet. Oh, 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 o